To kick off this conference, I would first like to invite the chairperson of MICAS, Ms. Phyllis Muscat, for her welcome address. Good morning and welcome to the MICAS conference, Art and Urban Public Spaces. This is the first in a series of conferences envisaged by MICAS and delivered through its education committee, intended to spur the discussion on contemporary art. I would like to welcome our keynote speakers, Professor Richard Noble and Professor Jean-Paul De Lucca, and our panel, Mr. Joe Magroconti, Marco San Michele, and artist Cesar Attard. Unfortunately, Christina Glesias was unable to attend. She is caught up in Grenoble and will not make it on time. We apologize on her behalf, but as we know, contemporary traveling is not without its hazards. We hope you will enjoy the discussion and we look forward to your interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Muscat, for your welcome address. And I would now like to invite our first speaker of the morning, Professor Richard Noble, who is the head of the Arts Department at Goldsmiths College, University of London. Professor Noble's presentation will be followed by a 10-minute Q&A session. Um. I need to decide whether I, I can see it better through my glasses. Yes, I can, thanks. Um, I would like to thank Phyllis and Georgina and the team at MICAS for inviting me to give this talk. I'm honored to be invited and delighted to be part of a conference leading up to the opening of MICAS in Malta. Um, I've had some experience of uh, building a public art space myself at my university in London, Goldsmiths College. So I'm well aware of the challenges and the, um, and the very great delights associated with starting a new institution for contemporary art. But today I've been asked to speak about the work of Christina Iglesias, specifically her public artworks. The basis for this request is the MICAS Commission um, of a work by Christina in, um, in Valletta entitled Sea Cave Entrance. Oh, sorry, you can see it here. Um, this work, which I saw for the first time last night, um, has been installed in an English garden on an old battlement in Valletta. And the plan is to transfer it to a sculpture garden that will be in the grounds of my castle at some point in the future. So I will make some remarks about Christina's work uh, specifically some of her public artworks, which I think may help us uh, to approach an answer to the perennial, di perennially difficult question, why should we commission public art at all? Now the kinds of answers I would like to give to that question are what I would call uh, intrinsic, or in, um, in the sense that I think the reason we should commission public art uh, are the reasons we should do it are intrinsic to art itself, to the value of contemporary art. And so I will try to make some a case for that. Uh, it won't satisfy anybody, but I'll do my best. Uh, but I also want to, to acknowledge and, and say that very important are, the, are many instrumental reasons for commissioning public art. It gives community status, it uh, enhances tourism, it, 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 it just generally makes the experience of the city better. So I'll come to that at the end. But hopefully my discussion of some of Christina's works will help you understand why I'm thinking of public art in this way. So Christina came of age as an artist in the late 1980s. One of her major exhibitions was at the Kunstverein in Dusseldorf. This is an image of an early work, one of her first um, wall pieces. Now these pieces of concrete and steel and alabaster and textile signaled an abiding engagement with the expressive qualities of materials, as well as the relationship between sculpture and architecture. We see emerging in these early works a kind of fictive space, as in the space between the sculpture and the wall here, 
um, a, a suggestion or allusion to a space within the sculpture that contains its own register of meanings. What these meanings are or might be is left to the viewer to, the viewer to imagine. But there are hints or suggestions in the materials. They may relate to the architecture of the building, to the history of the materials themselves, or to the visceral phenomenological response to their presence. As her work developed, new forms and new materials, um, no. yeah, sorry. I'll be doing a lot of, I'll be doing a lot of that. <laughs> Um, as her work developed, new forms and new materials entered her sculptural vocabulary. Notable among these are her vegetation rooms and her screens. And here's uh, an entrance to one of the vegetation rooms. Labyrinth-like structures that colonize the spaces in which they are installed to create hauntingly strange rooms or spaces to inhabit. Vegetation Room 3, 2005, invites the viewer into a winding corridor or passage. Its walls are covered in a dense green patina of vegetation that is recognizable as vegetation, but at the same time somewhat strange or otherworldly. Vegetation that might have come from a science fiction novel, for instance. I think the latter point is important to Iglesias' aesthetic. Um, actually, one other point is that if you look closely at the screens or at the, at, the, at, 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 the, at the patina of the interior of the, of the work, you realize that um, the patterns of vegetation are made from a kind of resin and they are simply repeated in each panel. And I think this latter point is important to Iglesias' aesthetic. She, she wants to create spaces that engage our ability to project ourselves into different imaginary worlds. Yet at the same time, she wants the procedures and the techniques she uses to create these spaces to be transparent as the work of an artist. So these works say, yeah, here is art. Where does it take you? What connections are you enabled to make? In this respect, I, I would suggest it, it contains a kind of utopia, utopian aspiration or credo that is related to the power of art to intensify and deepen our individual experience. One inhabits these artworks as an imaginative creative being. The feelings and thoughts and intellectual uh, connections one makes within them relate to our capacity to imagine a better world, <clears throat> even as everything around us seems to be tending towards the catastrophic. I say this as someone who lives in Great Britain. <clears throat> Christina began to make outdoor works in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Both her public, <coughs> excuse me, both her public and private commissions draw together many of the elements present within her non-public sculptures. Screens, fantastical vegetation patterns, and the creation of passages and rooms all play a part in her public works. But perhaps the most significant innovation in her public works is the use of water. Her earliest public work in Antwerp, Deep Fountain, 1997 to 2006, brings water to the fore in a way that has shaped the development of her public sculpture over the last 25 years. Deep Fountain is situated in the Leopold de Valplatz in Antwerp, in front of a very grand 19th century Royal Museum of Fine Arts. As Michael Newman, a colleague of mine, the goldsmith, has pointed out, the classic facade of the museum is composed of steps leading up to a row of columns, um, classical columns, an architecture that suggests both the authority of culture and um, the capacity of, it to, capacity of it to elevate us. Now Iglesias was commissioned to make a fountain in front of the museum and her response was to invert the claims or the pretensions of the original architecture by creating a pool of water that in certain light reflects the institution. So you can see here how the columns of the institution are reflected in the water when, uh, of the pool. But the, the, the water 
drains away into a cleft in the center of the pool, revealing a bed of fantastical vegetation. So the, the, in a sense, the reflected majesty of the Royal Museum disappears to reveal the natural ground of the piazza. Iglesias, is, uh, Iglesias responded then to the challenge of making a public artwork for a venerable cultural institution, partly by subverting its 19th century pretensions, but also by using an ancient technique from Islamic architecture of making pools to reflect surrounding buildings or gardens and to cool those inhabiting them down. One thinks of the cooling pools of the Alcazar in Sevilla or the Alhambra in Granada. The presence of a pool that fills with water and then drains away also subverts our expectation for a fountain in front of a royal museum, which would normally involve heroic statuary, possibly shooting water upwards, and in any, in any case, emphasizing, like the columns, the verticality and strength or virility of such a, an august institution. So Deep Fountain um, presents itself as a gentle critique of those pretensions while at the same time creates a beautiful and intriguing public space that enhances people's experience of the museum. So it both criticizes or gently critiques and enhances at the same time, which I think is a very interesting gesture. So Deep Fountain establishes some important themes that recur in Iglesias' public sculptures. Perhaps the most important is horizontality her public works often involve pools of water that reflect their surroundings but also disappear to reveal a deeper underlay to the site. The underworld is often vegetal, though as we shall see it, not always. It, it reveals a natural but at the same time fictional ground of the space underlying the fountain and the public human-built social space in which it is situated. It reminds us that the human constructions on the site are temporary, built on top of other histories, both natural and human. The work invites us to make connections between our present and the past embedded beneath our feet, to think not only about the various meanings we might attach to the site of a public museum or monument, but also the older and much longer natural history of the site and the environment of which it is a part. In this way, horizontality both subverts the traditional idea of the public fountain and invites reflection on the possible archeological or geological realities lying beneath it. Another way of saying this is that it complicates and potentially intensifies our experience of public space, which I think is an important aspiration at the core of all her public artworks. So Iglesias carries, sorry, that slide's not very good. It was great on my computer, but it's not so good here. Um, but this is the same image without the, the time lapse. Iglesias carries the trope of horizontality forward into a number of, of important public commissions. The two most ambitious of these are Tres Aguas in Toledo from 2014 and Forgotten Streams, which, of which this is an image, um, in London uh, from 2017. Uh, both are three-part works in the sense that each is composed of a horizontal, um, each is composed of three horizontal fountains with their own cycle of water filling and draining away and filling again. Both also invite us to make connections with the geological and social histories of their sites, though they do so in very different ways. I'll come back to that. I would argue here that of the two uh, forgotten streams is perhaps closer to Deep Fountain. It is comprised of three fountains on either side of a new, uh, very large building, Bloomberg building, in the center of London's frenetically busy financial district. 
There are two apparently connected pools on the west side of the building, of which this is one, and unfortunately I don't have a picture of the other one, but it's you know, on this side. Um, and these are connected by a huge arcade that runs underneath, as it were, the building or through the building down towards the third pool on the east side next to Cannon Street. Now the pools are surrounded by low brushed granite walls that allow for sitting. You can see there where you can kind of sit and look at the, the water. Um, and between the two pools at the top on the west side, there is an apparent bridge. And on the bridge there are bollards to stop traffic uh, driving into the arcade. So the water apparently runs from one pool to another. But it is as though Iglesias has stripped back the concrete asphalt surface of the city of London to reveal one of its ancient rivers. So there's this massive kind of um, opening in this hard asphalt concrete surface. The water evidently, but not actually, as I say, flows under a bridge between the two pools as it fills and, empty, and then empties away. As it empties, it reveals a dense, dense vegetal creek bed, recalling the long lost presence of the Walworth River, which ran through this part of London from Roman to medieval times. It's now deeply buried. The water in forgotten streams evokes the loss or invisibility of the environmental ground of the city of London, a ground that is constantly remade under the demands of rampant capitalism. And she creates a fictive link to the histories of ancient pre-capitalist communities who lived there, who lived much more imminently in this landscape. The sound of water flowing in and out of the pools is both unexpected and deeply soothing. At this uh, uh, and this movement establishes an independent time frame for the work that is cyclical. If you are moved to stay and watch the water recede and then fill the pools, you are suddenly inhabiting a different kind of time, one that is at odds with the linear and instrumental time frames that govern human activity in the financial district and indeed in most of our society. This allows one, if not to inhabit, at least to imagine a different manner of being, one that is focused on a more immediate and non-instrumental kind of experience, one that is attuned to the rhythm of natural processes like the flow of water, rather than the anxious striving for given outcomes, such as getting to meetings or increasing production or profits or whatever. So the work suggests a rupture in the busy world of the city, a moment of calm, of meditative possibility, of a different way of being that reminds us that people once did and could again perhaps live differently in this part of London. Tres Aguas is a three-part work, though it is installed across a wider area of Toledo. There are three sites, a pool in the, I'm not gonna say this properly, but the, the, the plaza, del Ayuntamiento, uh, which is in uh, the center next to the cathedral. An installation with a pool and with screens in a very intimate convent in, of Santa Clara. And a complex work in an old armory down below the city on the river Tagus. To experience the work properly, one must derive through the city on foot walk through its medieval streets down to the great river that made the city possible. You must pass by its ancient hydraulic systems to reach the armory and then return back again. This enables the work, this, this requiring the viewer to walk through the city, enables the work to gently colonize the history of the city as it is registered in its architecture and its hydraulic engineering to become part of the work. One starts from the large fountain in the plaza, um, the image of the cathedral reflected in the surface of the pool until it begins again to drain away. The derive takes on, 
takes one past the famous school of translation where Islamic and Jewish scholars worked to translate Aristotle and Plato back into the European canon. As well as buildings that were once synagogues and mosques and baths or markets in which the medieval population mixed. The routes necessary to experience Trezaguas draw the viewer into an engagement with the history of Toledo's Convincentia as it is reflected in the city's architecture, a unique medieval confluence of three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, into a kind of communal toleration. Tres Aguas works rather differently as a public artwork to forgotten streams in the sense that it evokes not so much a rupture with the life of the city, but a much deeper sense of the city's history and potential meanings that this might have for its present. We are nudged to consider an older form or model of how different communities might live together, which while not recoverable, might lead us to reflect a bit on the assumptions we make about our own capacity for tolerating difference. The armory tower in Tres Aguas represents a formal innovation in Iglesias' work. Um, this is the tower and you enter, you have to climb up the stairs and you enter from the top and then look down. And when you look down, you see, I know it's not very easy to see, but you see this rather deep excavation um, with water again <coughs> rising and, 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 and draining away. So the water, um, the tower is interesting because it's a vertical work. One enters at the top and looks down into a more deeply excavated pool, revealing the usual patina of strange vegetation. I mention this because this verticality and a very deep excavation recurs in a recent and hugely ambitious work in San, San Sebastian called Hondalea. Hondalea was commissioned um, by the city of San Sebastian for an abandoned lighthouse, which I unfortunately don't have an image of, <laughs> but this is the interior of it. So the exterior of it had to be left, because it was listed, had to be left as was. Um, so she decided to, to, to work with the interior. So it was commissioned by the city of San Sebastian for an abandoned lighthouse on the island of Santa Clara in one of the city's natural harbors. The lighthouse is perched on the top of an island, which is quite high itself, overlooking a steep drop down to a very rocky coastline, more or less constantly buffeted by waves from the Atlantic. Iglesias was interested in the geology of the island, but also uh, on the effect of water on its rocky coastline. She has said she was thinking of water crashing into underground caves and splashing up into the lighthouse. She wanted the force of the water to somehow be integrated into the sculpture. So to accomplish this, she effectively hollowed out um, the lighthouse, preserving its walls, but removing its various rooms and storage spaces, much as she restored the abandoned armory. Nevertheless, there were significant differences. The excavation of the lighthouse is much deeper, some nine meters down. And the patina of the surfaces is no longer vegetal, but mineral, like rock eroded by the action of water upon it over the centuries. So the challenge of taking on an iconic and much loved public building, which saved the lives of countless sailors over the years, is particularly challenging for an artist. One of the challenges, she believed, was to make this, its transformation from lighthouse to artwork believable which means that the fiction of the waves splashing into the cavern below and the building and then up into the building had to be believable, even though it was clearly impossible. There is consequently an astonishing level of uh, geological detail in the surfaces of the sculpture. You can see, which I will come back to in terms of sea cave. Um, while the depth and the, uh, of the chasm and the power of the water filling it uh, preserve the fiction of the wildness, the sublime, if you like, of the sea beneath. As a public work, Hondalea reinforces the importance of the island as a public space of refuge 
in the sense of a park or a natural reserve that one must travel to and should respect. Its reference points are geological and environmental rather than cultural and historical. In this sense, it is slightly different from the work she has made in cities, in urban spaces, which offer a different kind of refuge perhaps, but one with an environment completely made over by human endeavor. So Hondelea involves a number of elements that recur in Sea Cave, this wonderful work that's been commissioned by Micas. Both evoke the sea below by suggesting the presence of deep caverns beneath our feet. Both seem to be about the geological basis of the spaces in which they are built, but also relate to the environments on the surface. There are also very evidently artworks. Everybody knows there's no sea cave underneath this Hastings garden or whatever, but it doesn't matter because when you encounter the works, you kind of think they must be there. And so it's this sort of <laughs> tension between saying, oh yeah, here's a, this is an artwork, right? But then the, 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 the suggestion that there's something deep, something profound, something one had never thought of below us, it evokes a, a slightly uncanny, if you like, uh, sense of significance for the place. Iglesias has also been quite clever in the way, it's not so evident maybe in this shot, but in the way she's moved rocks from various other parts of the island to this space to create the sense that it's always been there, but you just didn't notice it. And this is, uh, I think, further enhanced by the growth of vegetation around the um, around the work where, so the park, it's almost as though the park is in a way colluding with the work to seduce people into its, its orbit. I think the believability of the work and its um, kind of visual uh, cleverness, the way the way she has made this complex series of bronze plates disappear underneath the surface of the, of the park is quite a considerable achievement. And the way of making these plates, and, and here you can see it's not at all vegetal. It's very, about, it's very much about minerality and rock and erosion and the forces of nature changing things. Um, I think this is a really, really uh, interesting and quite compelling aspect of this, of this work. And it, again, it, it connects us to an underworld. To it, it sort of suggests we, we, we can consider a deeper, very much slower history of the space that renders the current construct, the English garden, somewhat ephemeral, somewhat, yeah, temporary. So it's a strange and exciting place for people to visit and, and, and many people will find it completely unexpected. So Sea Cave entrance is part of a whole trajectory of public artworks that uh, Christina has been making for the past 25 years. It seems to me a very, very strong example of, uh, of her work. And I think Micah are to be uh, you know, very strongly congratulated for commissioning it. So I suggested at the beginning that a consideration of Christina's uh, public works might provide us with a sense of why we should value public art. We need to know why we value public art if we intend to encourage public bodies to commission it for our communities when they are daily faced with many righteous demands for other expenditures on hospitals and schools and, and so on and so forth. Now for me, the straightforward answer to this question is that public artworks by Christina Iglesias and other artists make public spaces more interesting and more beautiful. And these are qualities that any respectable civil society should want in its public space. 
But of course, no one is going to be satisfied with this, at least no one who has the money to pay for public artworks. Um, because the issue of what's interesting and what's beautiful about artworks is obviously quite contentious. Certainly not everyone finds contemporary art, even contemporary art as sophisticated as Christina Iglesias's, to their taste. And many others think that public art should be reserved for memorializing important political or religious or cultural leaders or memorializing important events such as wars or independence struggles and so on. Now, I don't want to enter into uh, here, into a controversy about statuary and memorials. Statues commemorating important people and events are hugely significant uh, for virtually all modern nation states. Um, but in my view, they constitute a separate category of public art from contemporary art. In fact, I'm not sure they can be characterized as art at all, but that's a rather contentious claim. It is true that there are examples of great public artworks of this type made by contemporary artists. So Rachel White reads Judenplatz Holocaust Memorial in Vienna uh, is an example of a brilliant memorial made by a contemporary artist. It's an absolutely astonishing work if you've ever seen it. If you've not seen it, it's worth seeing. But on the whole, I think statues and other memorializing works tend to be about representing or imposing most often politically dominant narratives about the history or shared experience of a place or a community. Sometimes these narratives are controversial and sometimes they are not. But the works commissioned for them are essentially instrumental. And this is for me the key. They are designed to achieve a concrete and predetermined end. For example, to unify people around a specific value or common experience or heroic figure. So statues and memorials are mostly not in uh, art in the sense that Christina Iglesias' public works are art because they do not derive from an independent aesthetic and intellectual vision. They do not proceed from an engagement with the site for which they are commissioned and they are not open to the same range of possible interpretations. On the whole, we do not inhabit them as um, On the whole, we do not inhabit them as imaginative creative beings called upon to, re called to reflect upon and construct the meaning of the work ourselves. We are, in relation to statues, we are either with them, against them, or indifferent to them because the meaning that they embody is fixed and, and determinate. What I want to claim here is that commissioning contemporary artists to make works for public spaces without a specific subject brief is a fundamentally different activity, but at the same time, one that is very important to democratic societies. So to my mind, their importance is both political and existential. Works of public art like Cave Entrance or Tres Aguas or the Micas Commission uh, of uh, uh, Sea Cave or the work by uh, Ugo Rondonone. Um, have no explicit political subject or intention, yet they are political in the sense that they embody and even enact values that are central to democratic life. They proceed from the presumption that artists should be free to express themselves in public space in ways that are not predetermined or instrumentalized by those in power. But equally important, the meanings they generate are multiple. They make no attempt to didactically impose themselves on their audience. And if they are successful, this can generate what might be termed utopian democratic moments for their audiences. That's a very bad phrase, but I couldn't think of any other way to put it. One such moment would be the opportunity to exercise your autonomy as an individual by determining what the work means for you. Works like Sea Cave demand of us that we think for ourselves about why we are moved by them or interested in them or not. And they very seldom give us a background framework for determining what they mean or how to judge their worth. This, if nothing else, is a good exercise for uh, citizens in democratic states. 
and it adds complexity and aesthetic richness to our lives. A second utopian moment can occur in, these kind, in the kinds of discussions these works have the potential to instantiate. So Jürgen Habermas argued once that artworks can provide the opportunity for discursive communication, by which he, he meant discussion in which each person's point of view is potentially valid from the outset. Everyone has a valid opinion about a contemporary work of art, at the beginning at any rate, and in which, discussion in which, there is no point beyond the formulation of an agreed understanding between the parties. So this for Habermas is a model of how democratic discourse should work generally. And of course, it never does work that way. <laughs> but public artworks can give us an intimation or a sense of the ways that democratic discourse might work. To discover ways forward, for instance, rather than imposing one set of interests upon another. So the sense is with an artwork, because there isn't anything at stake other than the understanding of it. People can discuss it together without presuming authority over others and engage in a kind of inter intersubjective understanding at the end. And this can happen very casually. You don't need to be aware of yourself doing it. But it is an interesting thought that works of public art can create the opportunity for different kinds of discursive activity. Now, there are, of course, many other reasons. So, so, so I'm suggesting these two ideas might represent intrinsic reasons why we should commission uh, works of public art and democracies. But there are other reasons, many of which are uh, instrumental for commissioning public art that have nothing necessarily to do with democracy or politics. They make our public spaces more interesting, as I've said, and they can make our experience of them more enjoyable and more intense. They can also confer status, particularly upon cities and districts of cities. They absolutely do not have to generate ideal speech situations of the type Habermas identifies uh, or suggests to be valued, though they are seldom commissioned without some kind of controversy or criticism. I think some degree of controversy over public art commissions is inevitable and probably valuable. Um, this derives from a tension inherent in the process. On the one hand, public art is thought to be an important embodiment of the value of freedom of expression at the core of democratic life, and as well an emblem or embodiment of society's openness and toleration. One might argue that among the richer democracies at least, the more sophisticated the public art commissioned, the more status that society has in relation to others. So think for a moment of Germany's embrace of, dem of contemporary art, much of it public, as in the Munster Sculpture Park, Documenta, and so on, after the Second World War, which was very much about establishing itself as a democratic civil society in the aftermath of the disaster of the, of the Second World War. But it doesn't have to be as grand as that. I mean, London, is busy commissioning sculpture every year through the Fourth Plinth Program, Art in the City Program, and various other commissioning bodies. And it does so to keep up its reputation as one of the world's centers of contemporary culture, to promote tourism, to make people think that London is an interesting place to be. So there, is, there are lots of good reasons for public bodies to commission public art, but on the other hand, there is this sense, perhaps more prevalent in English-speaking countries than elsewhere, that the people are somehow the ultimate arbiters of the value of public art. It is usually their money that's paying for it, and they're the people who must live with it. So there's some sense in which those who commission it must be attentive to their sensibilities and their reactions. Now, this tension is a practical problem. I think. Uh, I think it's inherent, and I, I would suggest that it can't ever be completely resolved. But I would I have a, a couple of points I want to make about the process of commissioning, and then, and then I'll open to questions. I think the most complex part of, public, of, of, of getting good public sculpture is the commissioning process. 
And there are many ways to do it, but from my standpoint and my experience, there are certain considerations that will help commissioning bodies get successful public works of art. And one of these considerations is that the process, the selection process, the commissioning and selection process, is only likely to be successful if it is governed by an arm's length principle. Um, which is to say that the people who set the brief for the commission and ultimately make the selection of the work should be allowed to operate independently of those who are paying for it. For many governments, including the one I'm currently living under, sadly, this is a very difficult principle to accept. They argue that such independence is undemocratic, that they are elected to safeguard the public's purse and to protect it from the pretensions of elitist art people like myself. Um, and uh, so they want either themselves or their own represent representatives to be part of the commissioning process. They often appoint people to commission works or they just commission them themselves. Now, governments have a right to do this. They're elected. It's absolutely fine. I, I get it. But the problem with this is with interference, with, with violating the, non, the arm's length arrangement. Um, the problem with it is that it inevitably leads to commissions that are reflections of the political interests and narratives of those currently in power, or what those in power imagine the, will be popular with the public. We recently had a very large statue commissioned in the city of Grantham of Margaret Thatcher. It's fine. but it didn't go through the kind of commissioning process I'm, I'm suggesting we need. So this, this kind of thing, these kinds of, 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 of decisions that violate the arm's length arrangement almost certainly lead to the commissioning of weak works of public art, which is both a waste of public money and ultimately of no value to the people in whose name the decisions are made. So one principle in developing public art is the arm's length uh, agreement, the arm's length arrangement. Another is um, the need for expertise. To get good commissions, the people setting the artist's brief and then selecting the work that is proposed to the brief should be experts. They should be political, or should, they should, should be professional curators, artists, art historians, critics, academics, who know the field of contemporary art, who know how to judge artists' proposals, and, and have some sense of the history of public art. All of this requires specialized professional knowledge that is, in my view, essential to the success of any project that involves commissioning public art. But such claims are open to charges of anti-democratic elitism. Why should a panel of experts be able to decide whether a work of art uh, is put up in my neighborhood or my square or my city? Who are they to tell me what art matters? Now, I think the answer to this is twofold. On the one hand, you need experts because, frankly, they know better than non-professionals what uh, proposals are going to work. If you're going to build a nuclear power plant, you don't ask uh, art historians to design it for you or commission the people who are going to build it. The same thing with public art. You need professionals to determine what is going to work. But at the same time, any process has to recognize that public sensibilities matter. And so there must find a way of involving stakeholders from the communities, from the government, from, from all parts of the society that are going to be affected by the work to have their say. Now, this is as close as we can get, and it's pretty obvious, I think, uh, to balancing these conflicting demands. Um, but in my view, expertise should always prevail in the selection process because that is the only way to ensure quality, the quality of the work. Nonetheless, those managing the process must find ways of feeding the views of non-expert stakeholders, stakeholder groups into the selection process. 
This is partly about education, partly about gathering information and opinion that is relevant to the selection. It's inevitably a manipulative process, I have to say. So my take on this then is that a lot of weight needs to be given to expertise. Um, but I also think that selection committees need to be constructed carefully. They need to be diverse. They need to be cosmopolitan. And they need to be willing to consider proposals from artists from around the world. It's worth noting that many, many good works of public art, like Tres Aguas, or Antony Gormley's Angel of the North, Thomas Schutte's Cherry Column, just to give a few examples, were initially greeted with hostility and incomprehension by the publics that encountered them. But this eventually gave way to affection and pride in every case. So there is always a risk in any decision to commission a work of public art. But the only way to mitigate that risk is to trust in the art itself and trust the people who value it. It shouldn't be instrumentalized, because as soon as you begin to instrumentalize it, you will, you will narrow its meaning, you will narrow its significance, and you'll end up with something that you will most likely end up with something that's not much use to anyone. Um, so just one final comment, which is that the commissioning process is hugely important, but it is only the first stage in the creation of a successful public artwork. Equally important are the installation and maintenance of the work. <laughs> and this may seem pretty obvious, but um, it's uh, not something that people always think about. So the funds necessary to uh, install the work properly and to look after the work over time, over long periods of time, are, are very, very important to commissions. And you need to convince the people paying for them, the public bodies or the private individuals, that part of the budget needs to go to this. There are many, many public artworks in very bad states of repair uh, around Europe. Okay, so Commissioning public artworks, at least in democracies, can be a contentious, laborious, and expensive process. It takes a lot of cooperation between different groups of people with different political and cultural agendas. But it is nevertheless an important public good, a process that produces important public goods. I hope that I will have um, convinced you that works like Sea Cave and the other public works that Christina has made do add something of intrinsic value to the places and the communities in which they're installed. I'm sure you'll have many questions, or anyway, some questions, but thank you very much. Happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. I don't know. Did I go over? I wasn't quite sure. About right. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have a quick question, which yeah. is: you talked about funding. Mm -hmm. To what extent does the um, involvement in things like the European Capital of Culture improve your chances of getting funding? Because obviously it creates an incentive for increased tourism and visitors to an area. Yeah, I think, I think that um, it would be fantastic if uh, Malta became a European capital culture, and I think it would benefit uh, your arts institutions a great deal. I mean, it's something you have to manage, it's complicated, but um, yeah, it generates a lot of funding that is arm's length, that allows um, artists and arts professionals, uh, um, not just in visual art, but in performing arts and cinema and all kinds of things, to make new work and, and for that work to be here. And so I think it would be fantastic. I, I should think you would have a very strong case as well. This is such a beautiful city. Um, yeah, it would be really a good idea. I mean, so it's a mixture of instrumental and in, in a way intrinsic value 
that such a thing could add because it, it creates the opportunity to make a lot of work that would be really interesting and, and really uh, uh, enriching. But also it would increase tourism, you know, so restaurants, hotels, uh, everybody else who benefits from tourism, the tax revenue would, would increase. So yeah, it'd be a fantastic. Unfortunately, I have no control over it now that I'm no longer part of the EU. <laughs> But uh, my wife worked at, uh, in Antwerp when it was the European capital of culture, and it had a quite profound effect on Antwerp as a cultural center in Europe. Uh, that was in the early 90s. Thankfully, you've, you've gone beyond the, just the commissioning of the artwork, but to all the behind the scenes which makes the commissioning of the artwork possible. Mm -hmm. And you've touched upon the um, political and policy making class which leads or does not lead to the commissioning of an artwork. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'd like to thank Micas for actually commissioning a public artwork mm. in a country which I feel really needs to really seriously question and have de a proper debate about the quality of our urban spaces and the quality of of everything which goes into our urban spaces. I mm. think we, we really would, it would be wonderful if Micas could take the lead on something like that, because it is not just the art piece, but it's also the urban space. Mm. But my question to you, and perhaps this is a, a bit controversial, um, is do you see a direct link between the commissioning of art and the promotion of art and, and the quality of urban spaces when you have an informed and culturally aware policymakers or politicians. So for example, I rather like your Tristram Hunt. Right. I thought, you know, what he spoke, said and the way he promoted culture and history and education mm -hmm. was insightful. What is your experience of the direct link between people who, at the top, are culturally aware and what it leads to? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, in the UK, um, there's been a, a strong tradition of preserving the arm's length uh, arrangement between the Minister of Culture, Minister of Universities Minister, and so on, so that um, there's this intermediate body called the Arts Council, which funds lots of public art commissions, galleries, and so on. And the basis for getting money from them is professional. So you apply and you have to have certain, yeah, you have to meet certain metrics, but it's, uh, it's, you're not applying directly to the minister. You're applying to a, a buffer organization. It's been eroded, its significance has been eroded, but uh, um, I would say that it's been really, really important. And uh, also for universities, our autonomy in, in universities in the UK is also being eroded by the government. They've subjected us to a regulator now, so we have many, many more hoops to jump through than we did in the past. But in answer to your question, <clears throat> my experience of um, public artworks, or I, I built a museum, um, my experience of politicians in this respect is that the best you can hope for from them is indifference. You know, if they're not interested, that's good, yeah. If it's when they get interested, when they see, ooh, there's a lot of, you know, tourism or there's a lot of, you know, I can get a lot of credit by standing next to the artist, all that, then it gets a bit tricky. Now, if they're enlightened, if they're guys, if they're like Tristram Hunt, fine, you know. He's a person with whom you can have a discussion. You could say to him, okay, you know, you've had enough photograph time with the artist, step aside, you know, and he'd accept that. But that's not going to be the case with Liz Truss, for instance, our current prime minister. So I think um, I'm, I'm really strongly committed to the arm's length process, particularly in relation to arts organizations, universities, entities that are going to produce um, things that people don't readily understand and need to kind of engage with and work at understanding and getting used to and, and, and that don't have any immediate commercial payoff, you know? Commissioning a public artwork like 
sea cave entrance is an expensive process and you cannot provide economic metrics. You can't tell the Ministry of Tourism that they're going to have sort of 8% more tourists next year because this thing has appeared and that's going to mean that it will pay back the cost of building it over three years rather than 10 or whatever. You can't do that. So you, you need to have people who are somehow committed to the idea that it's just worth building these things themselves, you know, without any long-term payoff, even though there will be a payoff in terms of tourism, in terms of status, in terms of lots of things will, will benefit. And also people's experience, as you say, of the public squares and intersections of the city will become better. And also, you know, districts will become proud of the fact they've got a really interesting public sculpture while their enemies across the wall don't, you know? Well, I think, I think uh, everybody should champion it. I mean, <laughs> no one listens to people like me. Yes. You have the expert class, which is, which is very engaged with the yeah. cultural community. Mm -hmm. And I think it is the European country with the most museums and galleries and cultural sites in per, per, you know, per square kilometer yeah. in all of Europe. So well, that's I'm, good. I'm just wondering who champions it? Who, who, who do you get to say, listen, guys, let's invest in, our, in the quality of our urban, space, our urban spaces, in, let's invest in museums, let's invest in public art? Yes, well, I think, I think as I say, I mean, I think uh, artists should champion it. I think uh, people of means who have the ear of politicians should champion it. And often in, like in France, for instance, you have an aristocratic tradition where even if you're a, a bourgeois, you have a collection, or if you want status, you need to build a collection. Also in the United States, it's the same. And, you know, then once you start doing that, once you start talking to artists, art historians, the people value your collection, you understand the importance of art, and then you can communicate it to the people in power. But it shouldn't just be that, it should be also uh, academics, uh, ordinary people should be championing culture. Culture matters. And we are, uh, I think, a little bit, um, this guy, William Davies, who's a colleague of mine at Goldsmiths, he describes neoliberalism uh, as, as, as a uh, historical moment in which economics saturates every aspect of life. So everything is subjected to economic calculation, scholarship, art, making art, uh, hanging out with your pals. I mean, you know, all the kind of cultural activities that we engage in are somehow subjected to the logic of economy, and that needs to be resisted. And it's because it's not good for us. It deracinates and impoverishes our experience and, and our culture. So I think it's, it's likely the case that the economic and social elites in any community are gonna have more influence on government. And so they should be trying to make the case for culture if, they're, if they support it, you know? But I think people like me or you or you know, whoever, sorry, I, I don't know <laughs> what your background is, but all of us who value it should be advocating for it. You know, I mean, we can disagree profoundly with each other over what works we're gonna pick, right? But we should be presenting united front to the powers that be, to, to governments and public bodies that increasing the amount of contemporary art, as well as museums and orchestras and theaters and filmmakers in the community is good for us. It's good for everybody. So it's a hard sell, but you know, we've been drowned out recently. I know I'm speaking mainly from the UK standpoint. Um, nobody's listening at the moment, but hopefully they will, you know, there'll be a swing back of the pendulum. I'm, I'm a utopian, I'm optimistic. Any other questions? Uh, Uh, I, I just have a comment about money, ex actually, because if, I think if we depend on government to fund public arts, then we'd be waiting till the cows fly or pigs fly. Okay. Uh, but we have a lot of construction here in Malta. We mm -hmm. 
and some substantial building. I'm not talking about the blocks of apartments, but there are major developments mm -hmm. in some instances. Uh, my experience in a couple of countries overseas is that when there are substantial buildings, as part of the permit, to get a permit to go ahead with your development, mm -hmm. you have to assign a specific percentage of the budget to public art. Yep. And uh, that then finances, at least you have the money. Yep. And then I agree with you that whoever commissions it and supervises it should be at arm's length and done by experts. But at yep. least the money then is assigned because if you yep. specifically for public art. Yeah, no, I, I, com uh, I completely agree with what you say. Yeah. Here, here, you know, we get permits given out and they give nothing back to the community. Yeah. So just taking. In, in the UK, we have something called the Section 106, which is actually a statutory requirement that developers give a certain percentage, it's quite low, but 0.6% or something of, of, the, of, their, of the cost of the uh, development to the local councils for cultural um, expenditure, but then the local council spend it on like slip roads to leisure centers or, you know, I mean, it, so it, it's a, you're right, and if it's properly defined and, and works, then it is an important source of uh, reallocating funds, particularly in places like London or Valletta and its surrounding uh, towns where space is really valuable and you know, development is kind of constant. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. This, uh, yeah. Um, when you made a comment about monuments and their meaning being fixed, and I wanted to ask whether, uh, well, I just thought that actually that's been challenged in the last five years, especially mm -hmm. um, monuments being reassessed in post-colonial um, thinking, and especially during the Black Lives Matter movement, and in Malta, maybe that hasn't happened yet, but statues like Queen Victoria have been challenged in, yeah. in contemporary art a lot, and the um, Thatcher sculpture was challenged by Cornelia Parker's film of her finger pointing in the shadows at the mm. Tate recently, um, and I just wondered whether you think that idea of monuments having a fixed meaning is actually changing in this kind of con contemporary reassessing of history. I, I, I don't think that the, um, the intention behind the works or, or what the works tend to communicate themselves is changing, but I think attitudes are changing, and I think that's very healthy, and I, I don't in any way accept that knocking down Edward Colson's statue in Bristol was an attempt to erase history. It's just a, a quite yeah, maybe violent and exciting reassessment of history. And I, I kind of thought the way it was dealt with was very British because they, they dumped it in the harbor and everybody cheered. And then they went and got it out of the harbor and put it in the museum. So that seems <laughs> kind of square the case, you know. Uh, Anthony Gormley uh, suggested about uh, Cecil Rhodes, you know, who was the, uh, on one, I can't remember the name of the college at Oxford, but there's a statue of him. He just suggested that they turn it around which seems to be an artist's solution, you know. So yes, I mean, I think attitudes are changing. I think it's healthy. Um, certainly in the United States, the, um, the, the taking down of a lot of uh, um, statues to Confederate generals that were put up in the late 19th century in order to um, reinforce the segregation of white people and black people in the southern United States I think the reassessment of that is incredibly good and healthy, but it's also very, very polarizing. You know, so you could imagine, you know, if a government or a, a group of people wanted to remove religious statues, for instance, how that might polarize people. So it, it, it's, it's a subject that's really, really contentious. Um, but I would say that, it, that these kinds of works are very different from what Christina or Ugo Rondononi or whatever doing, and I, and I think that part of the discussion around public art has got a little bit muddied by this controversy, so that's kind of why I pushed it to the side. Yeah. Are we done? Okay, well, thank you very much.
for that interesting presentation and thank you to the attendees who actually asked the questions during the Q&A time. Our second speaker of the day is Professor Jean-Paul Deluca, who is the, an associate professor at the University of Malta and has previously served as the founding director of the Centre for the Liberal Arts and Sciences and head of the Department of Philosophy. We'll have some time to ask questions as well following the professor's presentation. So good morning. Uh, Thank you, and thank you, Micus, for the invitation and for the impeccable organization and energetic organization of today's uh, conference. Um, and thank you also for the opportunity to explore something that is um, partly at least not exactly up my alley, um, even though there is a, an intimate historical bond between philosophy and public spaces. Uh, going all the way back to the origins of Western philosophy, in ancient Athens, we find uh, Socrates holding his dialogues in the agora, uh, the, the marketplace, the center of the city's public life. Uh, philosophy uh, was done in, uh, in uh, squares, in, in gardens, temples, public spaces decked with artworks that really had an exclusive decorative function. One of the great Hellenistic schools of thought, Stoicism, uh, which came to define a way of life, an attitude to things, draws its name precisely from one of the prime public monuments of ancient Athens, the Stoa Poikile, the painted portico depicting great battles and uh, displaying the spoils of war, at once a work of art and a political statement. Philosophers from Plato onwards have theorized about beauty art, its meaning, its value, and the relationship between aesthetics and politics features in the works of many 20th century philosophers like Heidegger, Benjamin, uh, Deleuze, Levinas, Derrida, just to mention a few. Uh, though admittedly, uh, relatively less attention has been paid to the more specific discussion of public art or art in public spaces. Benjamin, of course, famously wrote about the politicization of art and the aesthetization of politics, right, as a characteristic of fascist regimes. In totalitarian societies, the public space never quite belongs to the people. It is not of the people in a democratic uh, sense. And um, uh, any discussion about contemporary public art in urban spaces, as Professor Noble was saying earlier, right, must necessarily be tied or assume ideas of democracy and democratization. That is, it must be tied to the tense, difficult, fragile, contested, and continuous becoming of democracy. A philosophy, art, politics share the common feature of contestation. I work mostly on the history of ideas, on political philosophy, on philosophy of law, and, and I can't quite think of a term, a concept, that isn't contested. Uh, justice, equality, liberty, humanism, like all other isms, are all contested and contestable. There's also a list of uh, monuments, installations, integrations in, in urban spaces and other forms of permanent and ephemeral public art that have been both the object and the, um, and the means of contestation. Now, be it, the relation of, uh, be it in relation to ideas or to artworks, the freedom of contestation as a form of participation remains one of the fundamental distinctions between democracies and authoritarian or totalitarian regimes. Forcefully undermining the freedom, of, the, the freedom to contestation in whichever form, including and especially in its artistic form, of course, usually spells trouble for democracy. Now, it's not necessary for arts at least I think that it's not necessarily necessary for art to be um, shocking or to be offensive. 
but I'd say that it must always be in some way provocative. And I don't mean provocative in the shallower sense of the term, but rather in its more etymological sense. Provocare, to call, to summon, to challenge. A voice that calls upon other voices, eliciting dialogue, where contestation becomes conversation, where contestation is conversation. And the ability to converse, even when contesting, has long been held as a hallmark of the good citizen and indeed of civility itself. Just think of uh, Renaissance authors who, who spoke and wrote about la civil conversazione, civil conversation, um, and the, the ars eloquendi, the art of speaking or rhetoric as we know it, uh, which could also be connected in several ways to the eloquence of art with its different registers, idioms, styles. Public spaces hosting artworks can make place for civility by allowing art to create and inspire opportunities for conversations and encounters. That, I'd say, would be a contribution to democratic placemaking and participation. And here I'm not referring simply to a, uh, a minimal understanding of democracy that requires little more than fair and free elections every set number of years, and institutions that work according to the rule of law. That is the very basic, that is the very minimum for democracy to work. And I guess I'm looking at something more than um, participatory democracy where civil society is active in the formulation of policies and laws, though of course that is already a, a healthier form of democracy where there's participation in between uh, elections, right? Um, I'm thinking of democracy as, um, as deliberative, as discursive, as the likes of Rose Habermas um, and, uh, and others remind us. It is the practice of democracy that sees reasonable discussion as a necessary means for consensus building, rather than uh, democracy being a mere calculation of majorities. A discursive democracy draws on an array of sources that foster listening, uh, observing, scrutinizing, questioning, articulating. And art has the power to invest public spaces with linguistic and conversational possibilities, which is why something like a space where to sit down and hold a conversation Right. Um, in Christina Iglesias' uh, um, artwork we found there, is not simply clearly an aesthetic choice, um, but it is creating, in this case, a physical space for, com for conversation, for these conversational possibilities. Now, today's conference, um, uh, the, the blurb that, that was presented, is inviting us to look at urban spaces as, I quote, dynamic creative ecologies. It is asking us to imagine and discuss how contemporary art may create, quoting again, opportunities for placemaking, for wider participation, and re-energizing communities. And I'd like to highlight these two words, dynamic and energizing, or re-energizing. Aristotle, in book uh, nine, or book theta, of the metaphysics, but also in his physics and in his Nicomachean ethics, makes the, the well-known distinction between dynamis and energeia. Dynamis is the potential inherent in things, and energeia is the actualization of that potential. Now, if we had to take this definition of dynamic and apply it to urban spaces, we're no longer seeing them as dynamic simply in the sense of them being constantly changing, right, of hubs of activity and exchange. But a dynamic urban space always has the inherent potency of becoming something, of becoming something else. And dynamis in Aristotle is contrasted with energeia, a word, by the way, which he coined by uh, combining the, preposition, the proposition en, that is in, and ergon, which is work. Uh, and the, the definition in, in physics, which we still use today, speaks of energy as the capacity or the uh, performance of work. 
Energia is activity, the becoming of potency. Now here, of course, we're not discussing Aristotle's metaphysics, but I just wanted to recall this dynamis energia distinction, because when speaking of the role of contemporary art, or what the role contemporary art could have um, in dynamic urban spaces to re-energize communities, we're saying that art is part of the actualization of potential of urban spaces, and that as an act, art re-energizes communities in the sense that it actualizes their potential. And this includes their discursive, hence democratic, potential. A space is dynamic, but an artwork is energetic. It performs, it has the capacity to work. And art is not just the actualization of an idea, of the artist's idea, of the artist's potential, or of the potency of materials. Art is an act. And what kind of act could it be? I've already hinted at the possibility of it being an act of contestation, an act of provocation, of summoning, an act of artistic eloquence, a grammar, a conversational dialogical act. These are all acts that energize or re-energize communities with democratic elements. And they generate further activity. They generate further conversation. They... But art is also an act of citizenship. And citizenship is what allows for the possibility of fuller democratic participation. The artist is a citizen, a member of a local community, or a member of the, um, of the of, as a citizen of the world. The artist always belongs in some way. For citizenship, as the um, Canadian political theorist Joseph Cairns reminds us, is fundamentally about belonging. So in a certain way, an artwork in an urban space becomes the embodiment of the artist's citizenship, the expression of their belonging, their claim to be there in the public sphere. The artist and the work inhabit Right. We heard this, this, this important word this morning, inhabitare. They, they, they dwell in, they live in, they belong to. They claim a space in a place. They claim a place in the world. If art is an act, and here I'm referring to public art, if art is an act, then, by logical consequence, the artist is always an activist, right? a mover, a shaker, an energizer. But art, is, um, but art in public spaces is an act of democratic citizenship also if and when it fosters democratic attitudes, whereas the philosopher Fred Evans calls them, very aptly I think, democratic political virtues. In his book on political aesthetics entitled Public Art and the Fragility of Democracy, Evans considers three democratic virtues. Diversity or heterogeneity, fecundity, and solidarity. Diversity is the acknowledgement of the fact that democratic communities are diverse, heterogeneous, plural, and plurivocal. Fecundity is the creation and growth of forms of life in a community. And forms of life, as we said, in a democratic community, are also linguistic forms of life. While solidarity refers to a form of, un of unity that is not exclusionary of the other two. So heterogeneity, fecundity, and solidarity for Evans define democracy itself. And consequently, they constitute the philosophical criterion for determining what does and does not count as the kind of public art appropriate for the democratic city or the democratic space. So it is democracy itself, in Evans' idea, that commands, through its very core values, right, the criterion upon which one decides what, 
what counts or doesn't count, but what is more appropriate for a democratic context um, than, than others. And what is meant by a democratic space is the opposite of an oppressive, tyrannical, authoritarian, controlled space. Democratic spaces, Evans writes, recognize and allow voices, while the authoritarian space limits, uh, admits and fetishizes oracles. So there's a big difference between admitting, looking for, creating space for voices and this fetishization of, um, of uh, oracles. Public art encompasses any artistic creation that has an intent or effect of addressing democratic values and occurs in a public space. And the role of public art is pivotal because it explores the promise of pluralistic democracy, while it recognizes democracy's inherent fragility. Democracy is always a promise, or to say it with Jacques Derrida, it is always a democracy to come, la démocratie à venir. It's always a democracy to come. And by to come, Derrida does not mean some possible future, but primarily a dislocation from the present. Democracy is always deferred because of the tensions, ruptures, and unexpected events necessarily inherent to it. That à venir reminds us of what lies at the, hearts of, at the heart of democracy. It's transformative potential. Democracy can always transform itself um, internally, from within, right? Rather than uh, being transformed like, like other political systems through, say, revolutionary action. Democracy has this inherent possibility for transformation. Derrida recognized that every present democracy fails to live up to its ideals, and yet it retains its dynamic transformative potential by bearing the promise of change in the present. The very failures and flaws of democracy inaugurate possible democratic futures, which is not to say, of course, that they might not instead slide into forms of tyranny or, authoritar or totalitarianisms. But the point is that both when it embodies and values democracy and when it draws attention to the voices within it, art is fulfilling a democratic role. Democracy to come is always incomplete. It is always a becoming. It is being constantly made and unmade. It is always actualizing its transformative potential. The Greek word for transformation and for becoming is poiesis, which is also found in Aristotle, right? poiesis. And I think that we can speak of the poetics of democracy in a manner that is similar to how Gaston Bachelard famously spoke about the poetics of space in his famous book, La, po uh, La Poétique de l'Espace. Inhabitant space, he writes, transcends the geometrical space. The phenomenological experience of space includes all the memories, experiences, thoughts, fantasies, imaginations we bring with us. It imbues the space with meaning and vigor. Insofar as it inhabits public space, public art evokes and provokes this phenomenological experience, opening not just the space, but also those who inhabit it and experience it to transformation. Bachelard also uses, um, or speaks of the, the dream house that is projected in a manner that, I quote, is better built, lighter, and larger than the houses of the past. Uh, which is perhaps another reason why when uh, I look around us sometimes it feels so dystopic, right? <laughs> houses don't seem to be getting uh, lighter and larger. And he continues, it is a good thing for us to keep a few dreams of a house that we shall live in later, always later, so much later. In fact, we shall not have time to achieve it. So from Derrida's Democracy à Venir to Bachelard's dream houses, this may start sounding a bit utopian. 
which is a good thing, of course. Utopias are too often misunderstood and derided. Um, a political theorist, David Estland, has recently and quite masterfully rejected what he dubs as utopophobia, which is the title of his, of his book. Apparently, unrealizable standards of justice, he argues, are both sound and valuable, precisely when understood as standards. Now, it is, of course, not a coincidence that uh, if we look at the great early modern utopias, like Thomas More's Utopia, more coined the term, which became a common noun. So Moore's Utopia, um, uh, Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, uh, Tommaso Campanella's Città del Sole, we find that their authors were anything but sort of hopeless idealists. Right? They were profoundly engaged with the very real issues of social justice at the time when they were writing. And they wrote their utopias precisely to contrast certain ideal virtues with the real vices in their societies. Um, I've worked mostly on Tommaso Campanella, who didn't just write a utopia, La Città del Sole, but he also theorized a utopia. So I'll just say two words about his City of the Sun, which is a poetical dialogue, of course, a poetical dialogue, between a Genoese uh, seafarer and a knight or a grandmaster of the order, the hospitaller order of Malta. He, it is, he, the, he calls the dialogue, this imaginary dialogue, poetic, precisely because the idea, the idea uh, of a society, bears the promise and potential of transformation, of society becoming better than it is. And as in other utopias, the city of the sun also features public spaces. The purpose of its uh, seven circuits of, of, of walls is not just defensive, right, like our, uh, our, our, our fortifications, but it is also a place that hosts pictorial representations of universal knowledge. It's, it's like a, a, a walkthrough encyclopedia that inspired people like the great uh, Moravian pedagogue Jan Amos Komensky, better known as Comenius, who, who, whose Orbis Pictus, which is the first illustrated textbook, was inspired by this walk through um, the city, the city of the sun, where knowledge is depicted. And in a way, when I visited the, the, the Micah site the other day, so I couldn't help but think of, sort of the, the, the contemporary city of the sun in the sense that it is there between the city walls um, and it will be hosting um, public arts. Um, so, of course, writing in the 17th century, Campanella did not theorize a democracy, but he does have a concept of citizenship that is arguably more inclusive than what is practiced in the 21st century. And he understood that education contributed immensely to the good exercise of citizenship. And what we may term as public art played a crucial role in the education of citizens in the, in the broadest sense. Uh, I'm using education in the broadest sense. So, as an imago, as an imaginary ideal place, utopia itself demands comparison with the present state. As poiesis, it has the creative ability to change the present state. As we said, the democratic utopia, uh, we, uh, Professor Noble and myself did not, uh, did not exchange any ideas before of preparing our text, but the, right? the, the democratic utopia is equally incomplete. It is always changing, always in dialogue, always contested, and always dynamic on account of its transformative potential. It is the imaginative and poetic power of public art that defines its democratic role. I purposely tried to avoid being uh, normative when addressing the role of contemporary art in public urban spaces. Uh, not so much to avoid the oracle-like attitude Fred Evans announces, though of course that is a very sound advice, but because I simply wanted to bring to the fore some ideas that couldn't form conversations about uh, that role, about the role of contemporary art in public spaces, because reflection and self-reflection within the artistic community 
informs democratic forms of participation and deliberation. And, and I referred to Fred Evans' work, not just because I found it interesting and, and innovative, but because of the main question he raises. Can public art respond to the fragility of democracy? I found that question captivating and urgent. And I don't have an answer to it. Um, but I hope to have at least provided some, some hints and some threads in relation to activity, democracy, and utopia to kick off to perhaps inform a conversation around this crucial question on how public art can respond to the fragility of democracy. Thank you. Okay, if, there, if there's a question or a comment or perhaps. I think we have time for just one question. Okay, there's time for one question, so the lady's oh, the lucky, the lady's the lucky oh, one. Oh, I'll try and be very brief. Or a comment, it doesn't have to be a question. Thank you so much for those interesting juxtapositions that have emerged from both these talks this morning. Um, since, uh, it could be argued that since, since um, uh, Malta was for letter, for, was capital of culture in 2018, European capital of culture in 2018, Contemporary art in Valletta consists of tables, chairs, and menu boards. Um, but my, and and my, I suppose my question is is kind of related to the notion of plonk art that was um, addressed in the first um, um, talk, where, um, in the sense of institutions imposing art. On, on the community. Um, in, uh, but my, so uh, my roundabout question is, is about the, the, the movability of, of the Sea Caves artwork. The, uh, what are the implications for urban public space of an artwork that is installed in one place, public space, and generates discussion because a lot, I think, in that space, and then is moved to another public space that is perhaps a bit more private in the sense that it's within within an institutional framework. Um, I don't know if that makes sense as a question, but or if it's too huge, really, to... It is, it is a huge, it is a huge <laughs> question, I guess. Um, I, of course, I'm the, I, I say this seriously, of course. I mean, tables and chairs um, in, in, in the streets of Valletta and elsewhere do generate a lot of discussion and, and, and controversy, um, and I think that they do so for a, a, a reason, um, in that it is a, a very clearly an appropriation of the public space by private commercial interest, which of course can make the, the uh, do make the argument that in some way that what they're doing is a bit of a public service, which can of course be be, be contested. But um, I mean, when a space is by definition limited, right? So when you have a uh, public space being taken over, taken over to such an extent, right? by private commercial interest, it is what Richard was saying right bef before on, on what dictates, on what is uh, valued by whoever issues permits, etc. Because every inch that is taken by um, private interest, let's, uh, uh, in the form of tables and chairs, right, in the ridiculous form of tables and chairs, um, is uh, taking away not only space which is public, and we seem to have forgotten that the definition of what a public space is. But it is also, right, and one need not theorize it so much, it is also taking away, robbing the public of, a space with potential, a space that could be something else. Um, 
And if not for its artistic value, which is clearly zilch, right, the extreme presence of uh, tables and chairs um, should uh, generate a cultural discussion or a discussion of a cultural nature. Um, I'm afraid it doesn't, because or, or if it does, it is very often, which is good, at the level of aesthetics, right? Because, of course, I mean, aesthetically, uh, rows of tables and chairs, irrespective of how, you know, colorful the, 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 the canopies are, um, is affecting and does affect the aesthetics of a city, of a city that is built with roads, but of a certain weight, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, in, in a way, it's a pity that um, you know, Valletta is a cultural capital. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the end, in terms of sums, um, generated much more tables and chairs than it did um, works of, of, of public art. Um, I think that is uh, telling. It is, in my view at least, highly contestable if only it were you know, contested, contested more. But not from the point of view of, you know, simply of, 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 of aesthetics, but of what, or what kind of city we want. And that conversation must necessarily be a democratic one in the spirit where I, I try to at least hint at. Okay, I think that was the only, uh, I, I don't, well, we can continue the conversation over coffee then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor De Lucan, for your question, madam. We're going to break for about 10 minutes, so please feel free to get some tea and coffee, mingle a bit, and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes for the last part of our conference. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed our very short break there. We are about to resume with the second part of today's conference, which is a panel discussion chaired by Professor Richard Noble. The panelists are Mr. Joseph Magroconti, former Superintendent of Cultural Heritage and currently advisor at the Ministry for National Heritage, the Arts and Local Government. Mr. Marco San Michele, curator of the Design, Fashion and Crafts Institute at Triennale Milano and Director of the Museo del Design Italiano, Mr. Cesar Attart, local artist, and Dr. Georgina Portelli, MICAS board member and a member of the Education Committee. Professor Noble, I'll leave it to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so our first speaker is Joe Magro Conti, and I believe he has some slides. Yes. So I'll invite you to come up okay. and perhaps, okay. should we move to the side uh, so the slides yeah. are visible? Well, yeah. Actually, if they're all on that side, uh, you mm. can but some are on this side. <laughs> well, hang on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, all right, forget it. <laughs> if I do that, that's yes, it would be like a Tetris game. It's going to be a Tetris. So, <laughs> oh, okay, okay, so we better go down. I think if it's musical okay. chairs, it'll yeah, yeah, yeah. track from the... Uh, that, that was intentional, part of contemporary art interactive. <laughs> okay. So first of all, I would like to, to thank all at Meta for organizing this such wonderful opportunity. Uh, they asked me for a photo of a portrait of myself, but I didn't have any good one. So I'm displaying here one I took at Ravenna uh, of Dante, and we share the same uh, nose profile, so there is <laughs> at least a connection. So yes. Um, uh, I will be concentrating on uh, placemaking. We're talking about urban spaces, and urban spaces are not only of historic centers, but I would also dwell on other areas, okay? leaving out natural areas, because at times we have contemporary art requests for placing them in, in, uh, in, in other areas. Here I'm speaking on my behalf my, my, my thoughts, so um, please, please bear in mind that these are my own personal take on, on, on the matter. Um, yes, contemporary art is, for, uh, I consider it more daring because it's in the public eye. Any passerby can look at it, experience it, like it, hate it, criticize it, damn it, um, what have you. 
Several people, not here in Malta, but also abroad, do not go to museums or galleries. They do not have an affection, connection with them, even when such places are free of charge. People tell me, I don't have any connection with, I don't understand it, I don't appreciate it, I don't go there. But contemporary art in public spaces is there, straight in your face. You either look at it, admire it, or criticize it, or else you just pass by and ignore it. In this case, I show uh, uh, a piece of work of art, which here in Malta, um, um, some people rose controversy because the, the, the horse is missing a leg. Actually, the horse has three legs. It's not missing something. It's the way you look at it. The, the artist, Austin Camilleri, had his own interpretation. We don't have equestrian statues of victors, heroes, of these usually men on horseback. The protagonist is the, the, the horse, and nobody, nothing is perfect, and so uh, he, he was trying to deliver a message. So the first challenge is that it is in the public eye, and not all the public has cultural capital to understand art. And that is one of the main problems that has been uh, mentioned throughout this morning's sessions and questions, one has to dwell, ponder on cultural capital. The publics, different publics, different audiences out there have their own levels of cultural capital and understanding and appreciation. Contemporary art in public spaces in Malta has quite a history, in my opinion, because Earlier, centuries ago, the Maltese were already expressing themselves in their own way in the contemporary fashion of art of the time in public spaces. Here we see something typical, uh, which almost every village feast has, the statue of Malta victorious of the Great Siege, which makes us proud that we emerged victorious. And here we don't have a man on horseback, but we have a female representing a country, at least. Probably at that time there was more, uh, it was more felt as a nation rather than a country um, than today. And they used to commission uh, celebrate artists, but the most important thing, this was a community project. It was not just uh, the artist and the commissioner, the benefactor, but it was the community. Usually it's the community wanted it, the community raised uh, all this um, art in their piazzas annually, and they dismantled it, and the year after, and the year after, and until to this day, they're doing it just the same, even although over 100 years pa passed. So this is a community. Um, art. There was mention of monuments, and usually in mathematics you try to solve equations by dealing with within the brackets. So here I'm dealing with the difference between a monument and public art in urban spaces. Usually monuments, even the word comes from uh, ancient Greek and Latin to remember, all right? It is formal, they are commemorative, usually made of expensive materials, they are meant to last, okay? Annually you have celebrations, as we just ce uh, celebrated Victory Day on 8 September with this monument. But this monument, there were uh, questions raised from the floor about uh, the validity of old monuments in modern thought. Like, people may say, this monument may represent the glorification of war or chauvinism because the man is standing in the middle. Others may say mostly it was the men who were dying in the, in the, in the siege, why there are more women in the monument than, than are, are men. So you, you'll always have controversy with, 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 with monument. But then we have contemporary, the role of contemporary uh, art, so uh, contemporary art, we're not saying, as I get it, uh, that they're not monuments, 
okay? They, are, they have some different meaning. Um, again, they are put in public spaces, um, not necessarily in historic places, okay? They are free of charge and accessible, so people don't have to complain that to experience art, you have to pay or you have to go somewhere special through a door called a museum or a gallery. But usually they are more vibrant and dynamic than monuments, sometimes verging on funny, okay, fun, okay. Um, but uh, at times they are also uh, interactive, as we've seen with some of the works or most of the works of Cristina Iglesias. Interactive, and people like that interactivity. I have a great interest in the void, in the nothing, in the space, okay? We're talking about urban spaces. Um, here we see the ideal city. Even this painting has its controversies of attribution. That artist, that artist, that artist. I don't dwell on that. But the concept of the void. At times we miss out the concept in building and urban planning about the void, the space. The space is more sacrosanct. In, in often more than the solids. Here we have columnades, so you have spaces between the street and the building because there is a columnade. Between the columns, between the wall and the window, that is a void. Between the buildings, between the spectator and the buildings. So we have focal points and perspectives. That's what make an urban area, not necessarily the historic area, but also modern areas of interest because you have this interplay between the spaces and the voids. Okay? But then matters that concern me most, probably you're not seeing because of the chairs. At the lower end, we have, uh, yes, we, 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 uh, I stress the point on reference point. So if we have a building, a monument, a contemporary work uh, of art, somewhere in the urban space, it is sort of a welcoming friend, a, a, a node, a, a landmark, a reference point where people can meet or refer to a place. You don't know. You go abroad, you don't know what the piazza or the place is called, but you may refer to this monument or building or the contemporary work of art there. But then at the lower end, I have horror vacui, agor agoraphobia and the clutter syndrome. Okay, and with those, um, with the clutter syndrome, um, I'm very averse to clutter. Okay, um, if we have this space, we, we, we tend to clutter it. We need to add to it just because there is a space. First we create the space and then we clutter it with one thing or another. It could be also with contemporary art or a monument, apart from street furniture and other paraphernalia. So we have to be very, very careful also where to place contemporary art or a monument. Otherwise, we'll end up with cluttering the place. Okay. So contemporary art, in my opinion, is informal. So it's not like the monument, which is formal. It is either static in one place or dynamic, like one of my favorites. Um, work pieces, it could be moved around the city of Valletta. At one point it was in one piazza, at another point it was in another place. I tried to adopt it, getting it to the offices I used to work it, um, at, but it was over two meters, too heavy, and we couldn't get it in, so now it was adopted by a school, and I hope it is there. My favorite, because that is Ismin Isayar el Baitar, uh, time ripens the fruits, and it has something to do with heritage, archaeology, architecture, that by time these acquire value and gives us um, fruit. So yes, um, contemporary art can be fun. It can be uh, uh, not only sculpture, but also floor or wall art. Uh, we've seen with Christina's Iglesias, if we can call them sculpture, the fountains is a sculpture, yes, because it's three-dimensional, but it's flat on the floor. Usually sculptures are vertical, so um, 
we should not um, forget that contemporary contemporary art uh, is also uh, could be also um, other forms. And yes, uh, one one important thing: they could be contemporary art could be made of ephemeral materials, perishable materials that they don't last long, that they have a temporal lifespan, and then they um, get extinguished. And by that time, in fact, there was recently, I will be mentioning him later on, a celebrate artist, an unknown celebrate artist, known by name but not by person, who destroyed his work of art at the point of being sold. Okay, so it has this temporal dimension. So ephemeral arts materials in contemporary art are uh, a factor. And yes, now I come to two points where I might raise controversy, but never mind. Controversy is like the void and the solid. It should add interest to the debate, okay? So I'm saying contemporary art should not only be placed in historic places. Here we see part of Valletta. Um, it looks like a painting from De Chierico, Giorgio De Chierico, where you have only buildings, the shadows, the solids and the voids, okay? The floor and the sky, and that's it. Uh, no clutter, appreciate, no clutter. No road signs, no cars, no people, no one, nothing, except for a sign, which is... Sometimes placing monuments and art in places where they are already heavily visited, it has its advantages because you already have ready available audiences, but it could be an overkill, too much competition of what to look at. And at times when there is too much competition, it becomes clutter and you look at nothing and you just move away. When one places contemporary works of art in historic places or places of interest, it should not compete, but should be complementary and meant to add to interest. But then we come to other areas. Why not think about places which are described in uh, architecture and urban literature as non-places? where we have nondescript buildings, bad neighborliness, um, low quality of life, confusion. Why not trying to enliven them and put some life into them uh, by using contemporary works of art? But the key issue here is involving the community. There needs to be the community, as we've seen with the FESA decorations, which still happens year in, year, uh, year out, here in Malta, the community comes together and produces the art and, 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 and puts up the art and appreciate it and celebrate it, together with the visitors. So we need to use uh, contemporary art in public spaces to give a sense of place, where there is no sense of place, where there is no identity, where there is no connection, so as to reverse some of the clutter that we have. And we can see when the Vitruvian principles are ignored, order, symmetry, balance, proportion, rhythm, there are, they are somewhere there. Are they or not? What went wrong? We have the same set of rules between this kind of setup and this kind of setup, but something went wrong with the same rules, okay? Contemporary art, because it's often uh, temporal, it's like happenings. It's like a pop-up drama or dance that you, you see uh, in, in, in public squares. It is a happening because it's only a performance of one time. Even if it is repeated, the performance is a bit different. So contemporary art, more than a monument, has a perf performative role. And before concluding, I draw attention to this form of public art. This is 
perhaps one um, of the artists that is mostly um, understood. So it seems that all of a sudden the whole world has the same cultural capital. Okay, as soon as they see a work from this artist, um, somehow people understand it. And so much they have understood it that they are being stolen. Okay? When Banksy starts spraying or painting on one of the walls, a creation of a work of art starts. As soon as he finishes it, and probably stand back to see whether he needs to add some, some final touch, it becomes heritage instantly. Okay? As soon as he moves away, at least we assume that it's a he, so far that's what's been implied, there are people already thinking that if they find, they find a new work, they go chop up the wall, created and exported, in this case to America, to being sold at auction. So this is contemporary art in public spaces. It is because of the outcry of the community, not only of the owners, of the community who had that piece of art, that some of them were retrieved back in Palestine, in France, in England. Okay. Why is Banksy popular and understandable? Because he is provocative. It was mentioned, he provokes. He is popular, people recognize, okay, he is a rebel. And here I, I run, um, conclude by saying, uh, taking from Professor Noble's Utopia and Dystopia. Here Banksy is already telling us, we already, we already live in Utopia. It is these things that he's painting that is blinding us into dystopia. If we remove these issues that he's painting about, then we realize that we're living in utopia. And I conclude with this uh, blackboard full of ideas about what you've been talking about um, this morning, uh, what's in the literature. It's mainly as contemporary art in public spaces can be uh, a placemaker where we have a sense of identity, where we feel comfortable, and we participate in creating that uh, place as well. Thank you. who also has slides, so yeah. we'll sit here. Um, good morning, everyone. And yeah, that is me. I'm actually wearing the same shirt today also. Um, <laughs> it's a uniform. Um, when, uh, first of all, thank you, Mike, as for inviting me. And my first reaction after I got the invitation was, oh, how can I contribute as a design museum <laughs> director to a conference on uh, public art in urban spaces and and I thought in a very provocative way like okay I'm gonna show like a vast and annoying gallery of furniture design for public spaces so that's why, why I entitled my my 10 minutes contribution outdoor but then while I was uh, waiting for the beginning this morning and I had a lovely conversation uh, with um, Professor Magro Joan, okay. <laughs> uh, we, we, I, I remember the first time I was here uh, um, visiting Valletta and visiting the parliament with the AP Architecture Studio and I saw the um, roofless theater. So I would have uh, the, the ruin of the opera, uh, the, uh, the, theater, the old theater of, of Valletta. So I, I would have imagined and, and I want to title my, my, my um, intervention ruthless because probably after listening to uh, the previous keynote speakers the fact that uh, public art can be under another roof or ruthless is very interesting to me um, I'm going and I so I thought to revert completely my uh, sorry now no more 
surprises and start from the end of my presentation. This is the institution I belong. This is Triennale. It's a, actually, we are turning 100 years next year. We actually started in 1923 in Monza as a Biennale of Decorative Arts, and in 1933 we moved to Milano. And we are an institution devoted to architecture, design, urban studies, graphics, and fashion. And I run the Design Museum, and in this moment we are actually, uh, the Wall Palazzo dell'Arte is occupied by the 23rd International Exhibition. That's, we are called, that's why we are called Triennale. And Triennale is a funny entity because we belong to the BIE. We, are, we of course belong to the Italian state, and, but we belong to the BIE since we were born. BIE stands for Bureau International des Expositions, and that's why there are flags raising in front of our facades. So every three years we have honors and duties of a sovereign country when we invite countries to participate to the Triennale. The 23rd is entitled Unknown Unknowns, an Introduction to Mysteries. And the public art installation in front of the building is designed by Francis Quere, an architect from Burkina Faso that was lately laureate from Pritzker Prize. And indeed, this is a vertical structure um, in a urban space. Uh, there's no surveillance or guardians that take care of this building. Uh, from Francis Carey's studio, this is uh, an observatory. You can enter into the tower and you can see a portion of the sky. And outside there's a painting by uh, traditional painters from Burkina Faso, actually three incredible ladies that they uh, stand without any instruments but regularly paint these lines and triangles. Um, but what I'm going to show you now, it's what this institution in the past uh, century tried to uh, interpret the idea of public spaces with several in, um, uh, projects. And this is the last one that actually I uh, Im imagined a few, uh, two years ago. Uh, this is the last interpretation. We opened a branch of the Design Museum at, the tri at Linate Airport. Because to Triennale public art and engaging the, and working in the public space means to engage with a large part of the audience that they don't pay ticket to come to Triennale. And they don't come to see or they don't feel amazed by this elitist community that is gathered here together. And, uh, and often Triennale builds pavilions in the park in front of the building. So I, th I thought that in the finger <laughs> of where a lot of people, they take flights to go to Malta, like I did yesterday afternoon, you can see this at the moment, a glass pavilion. But you can also see at the departure and arrival all several uh, monumental furniture. This is a Carlton uh, bookshelf by Ettore Sotsas from 1981. And, and people, they, they look at, at these uh, bizarre intervention with curiosity and some of them, they now find out that Triennale is an institution that can present and offer culture to them. So it's a bit a rescue to do these kind of activities, but uh, they pay back a lot in terms of, of uh, unmeasurable benefits, especially in short terms. Um, this is an experience we realized with Kuo Young, a South Korean artist that actually built a skate park inside of Triennale. Try to imagine how many <laughs> regulations uh, we had to uh, Im um, write down with lawyers and, and, and associations because while we, you, when you could pay a ticket and come with your skateboard or scooter and try this, of course, with all the helmets and stuff, and we had several accidents. And, and then when we, when we planned this, this, this work of art, we also had uh, 
a, a sponsor, a bank that is still looking for a district in Milano in order to reinstall this skate park to give a second life to this work of art. But even though it sounds quite fancy, you know, a skate park like, like a marketing opportunity for, for public administrations, it is very, very difficult to find uh, um, a partner to do so. But uh, roofless <laughs> outdoor and, and tier 30 in the sense like uh, where without paying any ticket people can meet and follow a conversation was also this example in 2018 where we built a little teatro, a little agora community for public conversation where uh, because now thanks to the global warming we have like gigantic uh, storms in Milano, so we needed to actually have a sort of repair a shelter, but um, we did it very artistically with this balloon floating a tent. And, uh, but um, unfortunately, uh, we had to remove it because uh, um, a lot of people, and that's also another aspect when, we, when you build public art, uh, um, for the traffic, it was a problem. A lot of people were looking at this beautiful thing and missing the road. <laughs> so we got a lot of association trying to sue Triennale for this reason. But uh, when I was listening to the idea of like voids and perspective, this is another um, inheritance of Triennale. This is a, a theater, Teatro Continuo, by Alberto Burri. This is how it looks now. It's installed just in the Parco Sempione, where uh, Triennale building and the, the institution is. And this is how it was built in 1973 for the 15th international exhibition of the Triennale. So in somehow Triennale is um, quite a like, fortunate uh, in institution that we try to make temporary intervention lasting. And, and that's also another aspect, so sorry if I bring it to you uh, with a, in a very simple spaghetti English, but another aspect it for me is to make what is temporary contemporary. And that's another uh, uh, very sweet cherry we have in our garden but this is the mysterious path. It's the latest, uh, latest uh, sculpture uh, of um, the Chirico before he died. He did it for the 13th Triennale, in, 15th Triennale in 1973. But as you see now, no, there's, there's a fence around in order to protect uh, the fountain, but when the Chirico, imagine it was open to the public, you could come during the night, but due to vandalism attacks, now it's impossible to keep uh, this fountain uh, so freely open uh, to any kind of, 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 of interaction. But um, having a park, having a, like a, literally a public space close to our institution, helped Triennale a lot to face the challenges after COVID-19 because for many people coming to a garden was not an issue. So it's like, okay, grabbing a beer, drinking a glass of wine, enjoying a sculpture, watching a movie, or listening to a public conversation in the garden was not a problem. Instead of entering into a building or visiting a show. So we really thank the garden because we reconnect immediately with the community of Milan uh, and this garden and the park. Then before uh, I was listening, I don't know exactly the story about the Malta capital of culture, but when I heard that the inheritance is tables and chairs, actually this is a funny inheritance of, of the previous Triennale, when in 1954 they built a bar, like a restaurant and a bar where people could come and just have a pizza and stay together. Uh, but it was designed by uh, Ico Parisi and Livio Longhi, and people could come and say like, okay, I'm not going to see an exhibition, I'm just going to stay in a wonderful place and 
meet people. And this is how it looks more or less today. Uh, uh, it does not belong anymore to Triennale, but it belongs to our history. Last example, this was a pavilion of, in 1954, um, uh, designed by Ico Parisi together with Francesco, the artist Francesco Somaini and the art and artist and designer Bruno Munari for presenting kitchens and living rooms that at that time in 1954 were the, let's say, the frontier of good domesticity and nice interior. And now it became a public library. This is how it looked in 1954. It's actually uh, 80 steps from the entrance of Triennale. And, and people, they go there, and this is how, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, pavilions and that they were meant to be very temporary for um, short uh, purpose, they became part of the city and people, they, they feel very comfortable when they go there and they enjoy um, what Triennale has been and it is nowadays. Thank you very much. Um, so now we have a, a talk from Cesar Attar, uh, who will also be showing slides. Uh, I will uh, only uh, comment on a few vignettes describing some of my projects since uh, realized since uh, 1975 in Malta. Uh, one. Huh? In August 1975, a group of art artist members of Vision 74 decided to do some artwork in order to involve the public at the Bar Upper Baraka Gardens. I decided to draw car-sized portraits of the people sitting around, one by one. With the help of younger artists, we drew some 50 portraits without revealing the results. We shuffled the drawings and again approached the sitters with the question, fit the in Nefsek? which roughly translates, search for yourself. Sifting through the drawings, the lady said, this one is me. Yes, because, no, that other, no, my nose is not as long as that one. I said, please sign underneath the drawing. I knew the participants would most likely recognize their portrait in relation to the others, rather than in isolation. This suggests that rather than the mere gaze, the mere gazing at their self-image as if in a mirror, it is this sense of communality that contributed to the participants' sense of who they are. Two. A year later, I propped 100 cards upon freestanding poles arranged in grid formation in front of the main guard, Valletta. The cards showed algorithm-generated drawings originating from profiles of human heads. They were meant to be viewed as iconic vertices forming grid-based environment through which participants, conditioned by the rigid geometry, would be able to walk. I approached those present and switching roles, I asked them to draw my face with a marker fixed through a black cloth covering a sheet of paper, which I then put in a bin without revealing the drawing. They had to fetch the right one and sign it. They did so effortlessly. To the participants, the installation was rigid and controlling, but the drawing sessions warmly relational and rewarding. I saw the performance as an antidote to the installation. Three, 
1977, Maltese artists were invited to show their works during open day at De La Salle College, Cotanera. The language laboratory was the site of the performance called Human Pantographers, a cybernetic experience, which I devised for the occasion. I sat at the main console. The participants in the booth had to draw straight lines in the direction announced over the intercom. Basically, the direction words were left, right, up, down. At the end of each session, I saw participants comparing their drawings and grinning at the absurd mismatch caricaturing human communication. The whole setup was indeed a parody of itself and of every such dictatorial organization. Four. A year later, I decided to use an ID card as basis for a participative performance during an activity by Azad, a political academy for the development of a democratic environment. People were invited to draw an outline around my body, which was prostrate on a large sheet of newsprint, and stencil my own ID card number on the chest area. I then painted their face into the head area of the silhouette. And so it went on with anyone volunteering, male or female, my body contours, their face, and my ID number. One could not but notice the superfluity of the ID number and the ambiguous mix of gender that resulted. Now that we're living in an age of mass surveillance, so to say, we can better understand how the very idea that a digital system could potentially define persons rubs abrasively against our belief of who we are. Five. In 2007, an art collective at the Center for Creativity in Valletta brought together Maltese and international artists who were asked to react to the Damoiselle d'Avignon by Picasso. I called my installation unfinished. Somewhere in the building close to, the, to other entrances, Asherettes, pink shapes representing the five girls in Picasso's work, swiveled on poles strategically dispersed around the building. They were meant to indicate the direction towards the unfinished painting placed in an obscure location in the building. As signs indicating direction, they were useless because visitors could have accidentally disturbed them. Anyone intent on getting to the goal could do so, only to realize that there is no logic in the search. The goal of this work is nothing else than the search for a goal. Given that art history abounds with definitions of art, one may conclude we have not yet decided on one, suggesting we are uncertain what the goal in art should be. It appears to me that in art too, we search for a goal, but the work and the search remain unfinished. Six, there are two ways of interacting with Tongue's Gate, by just looking at it or by walking through it. For a group show called Milkshake in 8 March 2013, I proposed Bibelsna or Tongue's Gate. Being provocatively close to each other, the bouncer rubber tongues define a relatively narrow passageway that dares visitors walk through it to enter the galleries. This being the reward. The action, a small feat in itself, turns the visitor into a participant actor at the center of attention. The raison d'etre of the piece is the participant's behavior and attitude in response to how tongue's gate functions as a gate. The diametrically opposing right and left sides are activated by the public, passing between them. While doing so, participants occupy a middle ground, 
between contraries emblematic of the simplistic, polarized position that oftentimes characterize social and political environments. Seven, inspired by my own six so-called ink drop experiments of 1974-76, the installation I proposed for an exhibition launched on 19 October 2017 was called BSB, or Blood Spittle Blank. I held the first of a number of events on the opening night, substituting blood or sputum for ink. I introduced a highly personal and physically intimate set of actions for the participants to choose from, after having officially given their consent. They were asked to either prick their finger and let a drop of blood stain a host-like cotton pad or drop sputum on a square reactive paper, or else present a blank sheet. They would then proceed and fix it on a wall arranged for the purpose. Blood, especially for whom and by whom it is shed, is a powerful symbol for humanity since time immemorial. Spittle or sputum was thought to cure and protect, but it was also thought to be a sign of contempt and pollution. Blankness is anomalously either mental vacuity or downright abstention. I was little more than a facilitator of the event in which the public could decide whether to take part and make a choice or just watch. Somehow, all those present were actors. To conclude, if contemporary art functions as an agency energized by actors rather than being an ocean or concept in which we are there, to which we are there and conform, then no definition could transfix it to a timeless identity without contradiction, as that would entail a sequence of institutional identities again to be defined, promoted, defended, and justified. One might suggest that actor members of an institution may be controlled by it. And my, uh, MICAS is institutional. But institutions, being products of formal or informal codification like rules, laws, and statutes, are open to revision. Thus, one could expect that actors potentially have the power to recodify the institution. Or more realistically, to influence how it evolves in an ever-changing environment. Thank you. Um, do you have sight? Oh. So we're now going to move back to the chairs. So our, our next speaker is Georgina, who I think is known to all of you very well. Right. Um, so, um, for my part, um, I would like to talk about mainly the Micus remit um, and the significance of the public art Micus has commissioned. I want to focus on the urban garden as a public space for aesthetic intervention and why Micus chose to work with an artist like Christina Iglesias. Essentially, the multi international contemporary art space, Micus, has been entrusted with a very specific remit. As cultural infrastructure, it is meant to provide a platform for international art, um, motivated by an internationalization objective. The Micus mission is to propagate a cultural ecology this allows our audiences to experience a wide range of international contemporary works of art, build bridges by acting as a platform for innovation, cultural exchange, debate, and provide accessibility for wide audience participation. 
and community engagement. The Micah's Galleries, once open, will operate on a Kunsthal principle, hosting temporary exhibitions, while its outdoor spaces, including its garden, will host temporary and permanent work. The characteristics and operating principles of Micah's align with those of any public arts organization, specifically a commitment to a strong civic role, namely one rooted in local needs, essentially that of developing community agency and building social and cultural capital. Above all, Micah's remit is to raise the bar, champion artistic quality and diversity while providing challenge. Micah's also has a strong educational remit and this conference today is one example of the ways Micah's will be engaging with the wider public on issues related to contemporary art and community. As we all are aware, public space within a city evolves and changes over time, being constantly made and remade, created, recreated. We experience this all, all the time, with some places witnessing very drastic overhauls, um, others going totally haywire, and while others' spaces remain dead and lifeless. These dynamic transformations or lack of may impact both the physical form and the social function of public space. Although cities grow, decline, revive, public space remains intrinsic to the heartbeat of our towns and cities as spaces for placemaking, meaning mating, making, <laughs> and potential lieu de memoir. Cities are human habitats, and the pervasive need for public space and its various function bears out the fact that as social beings, we need to interact with others, whether as strangers or acquaintances, constructing meaning out of temporary shared social worlds. Therefore, public space becomes vital as places where such a social need can also be met. Aesthetic and social function <coughs> have an undeniable correspondence, given that aesthetic as appreciation of space is contingent on how communities and visitors perceive it. As Stedman points out, public space becomes place through the interface of the physical environment, human behaviours and social and psychological processes. The Mycocetus seeks to combine the social and the aesthetic to offer communities and visitors active opportunities for placemaking. I'll focus a bit now on the Mycus programme and the Urban Historic Garden. The Mycus programming to date has focused on interventions in historic public garden space. The commissioning policy intrinsically looked at both permanent and tem temporary pieces for outdoor spaces, all extramural sites within the community. We explored this in 2018 in our immediate neighborhood with Ugo Rondinorda's Radiant at the Melorda Garden, Pierre Wieg's Exomine Deep Water within the wider community at Busquet Gardens, and in the wake of the COVID-19 disruption, Christina Iglesias' sea cave entrance at Hastings Garden in Valletta. Why did we consider the Bastion Gardens um, as sites for intervention. Mykes's immediate neighbourhoods of Florian and Valletta host numerous historic gardens, which are like tesserae of open spaces and greenery, very much in harmony now uh, with the built environment and the harbourscapes. Uh, within the dense urban context of the harbour regions, where heavy urbanisation as anthropogenic intervention inevitably over the centuries has resulted in loss of habitats and biodiversity, these urban gardens, however, act as nodes of connectivity between the natural, the social and the material. The urban histories of Valletta and Floriana, furthermore, are also intertwined with the sea as a natural element and the rocky maritime coastlines of the harbours. Hence, the seascapes of Marsamchet and the Grand Harbour are deeply rooted in memory, engendering feelings of belonging in our communities. On the other hand, the sight lines from the Bastion Gardens provide viewers with clear access to the visible horizon, reiterating our relationship with, and connectivity to a much wider ecology. Recognizing this, the Micah's vision is to instill a consciousness towards natural environments by creating the condi conditions for such connecting nodes to take root. The primary aim here is to provide opportunities through art for meaningful connections between communities and the social, physical, and natural environment, while reinforcing relationships and the sense of belonging. 
Why did we choose to collaborate with Christina Iglesias? Micus is keen to showcase public art that critically engages with place and context, while ensuring that such work positively becomes accessible to a wider audience, whether on site eventually or beyond the walls of Micus. This is what motivated Micus to engage with an artist such as Christina Iglesias. Christina Iglesias, as Professor Noble very ably demonstrated, is an exceptional exponent of public art. She has a sublime ability to create extraordinary imaginary landscapes with immersive contemplative spaces. Her, lyr her lyrical work emerged from a poetic weave of architecture, memory, place, ecology, and perceptual catalysts. Dense historical landscapes, such as those of Florian and Valletta, require sensitive interventions that can nonetheless challenge. Christina Iglesias' intervention, CK Ventrance, I believe does this very, very well. She engages sensitively with the complex layering of cultural traces, traces and memory permeating the Marsamshet Harborscape, St. Michael's Bastion, and Hastings Garden. Sea Cave Entrance brings to the surface what may lie underneath. It unveils an imaginary opening to the subterranean space, exploring hidden geologies, interconnection, and the passage of time. Actually, Valletta um, does have an area which is known as Talerin, the area of the caves, or uh, just right below the Great Siege Bell. And there are also subterranean caves from the area known as Tar Il Galletta, I believe. Um, nonetheless, uh, you know, the, the work hints at a liminal threshold, the potential entrance to a cave with the sculptural form delving downward to expose stratified layers and an imagined, pitted and hollow geology. The smoother upper overhangs contrast with the dynamic surges of underlying, underlying layers. Water moving in slow or fast sequences becomes the unifying element of the work as it seeks to catalyze perceptual engagement. Its surging sound reconnects us to the sea that can be glimpsed over the bastion walls, which we sometimes tend to forget that Valletta actually, you know, the sounds of the sea in Valletta are totally drowned out by the, by, by the rest of the uh, soundscape in the city. The bronze bas relief work is eloquently articulated in the artist's distinct um, sculptural language. There it sits in conversation with wild thyme, sempre viva, and caper plants, indigenous flora that root the work further, together with local hardstone boulders interspersed with fossil shells. The imaginary landscape changes with the seasons, allowing for unstructured radial growth to sprout and bloom. The artist looks to uncover an imaginary lost habitat to connecting us to a more primordial Valletta. Pragmatically, the aesthetic intervention at Hastings Garden sought to reinterpret an essentially arid plot with poor soil and a few shrubs into an inclusive, immersive, contemplative space for the public to enjoy. No flower bed border impedes access, and one can walk on the grass and sit on the stones. It becomes a social space for public interaction. It is also interesting to note how hesitant people were initially to walk onto the space and approach the work. In fact, one hears the work before one sees it, but once um, you know, this barrier is broken, people engage with it. And we document this um, often, and we see people enjoying the work. Uh, this type of socio-aesthetic context that the artist proposes here seeks to root a new cultural ecology that supports urban biodiversity while encouraging new connections between meaning making, physical space, and action in public space. We believe that this approach to art in public spaces will enhance the opportunity for greater connections with our community by fulfilling the specific remit of making contemporary art accessible to all. Thank you. Um, yes, I want to thank all, all the speakers for a very stimulating uh, series of talks and um, probably more than any of us can take in in one, <laughs> one moment. But I wanted to start with a question for Cesar uh, that your talk raised for me and, and also um, um, uh, Joe and, and Marco in a way alluded to it, 
we spent much of the first part of the morning talking about public artworks that are actually objects, you know, that have a place that constitute a kind of public space or animate a public space. But you cited a couple of projects that you had done that were processes. And they were kind of performative in a way that they, mm. they got people to interact and so on. And I wondered, um, how, do you, how, how do you feel about the, in it, as it were, the time-limited character of these performative public works? I mean, would you like them to be documented by being filmed and so on, and, and that documentation kept in a museum? Or are you quite happy to produce a public work that happens in a space and then finishes? No, actually, uh, the character of those works can be repeated. Right. So um, one cannot say that that performance is an object, um, uh, like, say, a piece of sculpture. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the idea is that um, the way they are structured um, uh, it's not something that you can... S there's a sp a sp there are spectators watching uh, mm. uh, what's going on. Uh, it doesn't produce a border um, between the public and the performers, mm. but actually engages the, um, uh, the individual, uh, uh, individual participants um, to be part of it. And it is the experience uh, almost analogical to um, how we experience a, a painting, for example. Mm -hmm. um, if the painting is hidden away or, or is in Mars and nobody sees it, <laughs> nothing happens. We cannot say, oh, well, that's a, work, a great work of art. Of course, we can say it if we imagine it, yes. because that's the part that's what makes it a work of art. Mm. The fact that it is in, our, um, in proximity to, to our individual response. Right. And, um, and so, therefore, for this reason, you can rep um, replicate it, um, not the way um, once um, uh, uh, a troop asked me to uh, replicate, uh, kind of uh, reenact one of the um, performances, and I did it for the camera. I brought the, the, the uh, what you call them, or the, uh, um, uh, the uh, extras. <laughs> and I, I think, I, I don't like it, it's, it's all fake. It's not like that. You have to do it, like, for example, the last one, the BSB. Um, I, 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 I intended it to be repeated across the country, if mm -hmm. possible. Okay. Of course, uh, later on came the COVID, and that, that um, would, of course, uh, be an argument against yeah. holding it at all. But there is a way of doing it. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, I had one other question, which is um, uh, uh, put in my mind by Marco's comment about the success of the sculpture park in the COVID period. And uh, for Georgina, uh, I mean, uh, why have you decided to include a sculpture park in the, in the Micas um, sorry? construct? Sorry. That's for me. So you yeah, uh, oh. sorry, for, for Georgina, yeah. yeah. So shall I start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the, the idea of the sculpture park or garden park, Micas has a lot of outdoor areas. It also has a wonderful Terrace, um, uh, the San Salvadore ga counter guard, which lends itself to this. Um, um, I think the idea, not simply of display, but the idea of presenting a platform for for art for mm -hmm. temporary pieces too, not necessarily. So, um, in investing in acquisitions is not, um, you know, something you can do every day. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of having uh, outdoor areas that you that extend the galleries too. Um, I think um, it, it, uh, it gives the, the programming, I think, much more flexibility too. Uh, specifically because we want to, to uh, 
you know, to showcase art that is uh, cutting edge, art that is uh, uh, not static in that sense, uh, um, and to to ensure, uh, you know, there's a specific contemporary um, idea that we are adhering to. Because once uh, I think we limit ourselves there, um, then we, we run into issues. Um, so I think the garden will, uh, will, uh, will help us fulfill that role. Yeah. Has it been a great help to your museum, your garden? Uh, the sculpture garden of Triennale is a quite an eclectic space. Mm. And, and I'm saying eclectic because I don't have a, a more gentle word to say how mm. diverse and and sometimes rich of interventions that nowadays we are not very proud of, mm. many of them. Yeah. But the public uh, consider that space as a very democratic one. Right. They come to the, the garden because mm. they think that they don't need a degree on history of art to understand what, right. they, have, okay. what they have around. Mm. And, and also because uh, we think that the, the all the, what we call the community mm. is actually a large amount of private individuals mm. that they come to Triennale and they think, okay, I just been, I just had a long day at work. I want an aperitivo, and I come there and I can mm. get something that is uh, manageable for the amount of energy of <laughs> and time I have today. Sure. Yeah. But then it is there an occasion for us to invite them to enjoy all the other, mm. uh, all the, all the other cultural offer of, of Triennale. And, yeah. uh, and in this case, it worked a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a way, it's seducing the public. Seducing, into, yeah, yeah, you just actually used the seductive power yeah. of, 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 of art that is also, uh, um, let's say, um, uh, memento to mm. us to do not be so elitist when we do a selection of, yeah. uh, uh, of an art piece. In the but I, I also think it's really fantastic that it's a design triennale, but you're using art, to, the, the borders between design and art are quite blurred in the way you spoke about it. And you had a fantastic Buri uh, theater yeah. stage, you know. Uh, I think too often, these disciplines get reified and rigid, you know, and we're too, we have design over here and we have art over here and so on. So it's very nice that, so will you also have design, do you think, in market? Well, we do, we do have design and architecture mm -hmm. in mind. Um, okay. we, we do have to find the funding for it. <laughs> but uh, we certainly want to um, uh, develop a design and architecture annex, mm -hmm. which, which hopefully can, uh, can uh, uh, can showcase uh, uh, design and, and architecture. I think it's important from a contemporary perspective that design is included in the, um, you know, in the offering. I think it's important. Yeah. And it's a vibrant part of Malta's culture anyway, design, right? So, sure. I mean, you know, so, yeah. So. Um, uh, Joe, I want to ask you a question. Um, as I was listening to you talk, I was, I was thinking that you maybe had a background in urban planning <laughs> because of the way you were talking about the, the need to avoid clutter, which I, I'm totally on side with. And it's, it's avoiding visual clutter, but it's also, in a way, with space, is avoiding too many ideas or too many things going in too many directions. Um, but, and so, I mean, that can be a criteria for selecting public artworks for spaces, but I got the sense that you were suggesting that some spaces should just be left alone <laughs> to, to their history or <coughs> architecture. Yes. Ac ac actually, um, whoever is commissioning the work and the artists, mm. together if the community is involved, um, they should look at the, uh, at, the, at the place and experience it from different viewpoints. And as I sometimes do. I am in a place, even in a gallery or a museum, and eavesdrop, sort of, to speak, of mm -hmm. what people are commenting about, what are they looking at, what, what are they shooting photos of. Like, if we're in Valletta, I see overseas visitors taking photos 
And then I say, of oh, what? Then I look up and say, oh, how did they manage to spot something up there when there is a lot of happening at, at, at eye level? Yeah. Um, so I, what I suggest is rather than someone commissioning an art piece and the artist starts creating an art, it would be uh, ideal that they experience this space together with whoever going to experience. Mm. And with, as with classical architecture or classical art, okay. I was taught that classical art is not just the Greek or Roman, but it's something that you cannot add on or subtract from right. without distorting. Mm. So at times it's looking closely at the space, mm -hmm. what we have, irrespective whether it's a historic center or a modern one mm. or a non-place. So because we have modern urban areas which are pleasant. Yeah. So we have a variety. Looking at that and critically looking at what one can add, how much. Sometimes it's the color of uh, color and texture or size. Yeah. Or whether there is the basic principles of architecture like mm. rhythm, proportion. So what to add to that without distorting the, the, the place? But yeah. yes, um, my concern is overcrowding mm -hmm. a place that then it would become less interesting yeah. and confusing. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. Um, before we open it to the audience, I wonder if the panelists have any questions for each other. <laughs> ah, ah. Um. Mm -hmm. no? Not particularly, but I would love to pick up one aspect that Professor De Luca uh, underlined, if okay. I understood well his very intense uh, presentation about the one of the, let's say, negative aspects of, of adoring the, uh, let's say, uh, the power of public art in terms of transforming places, like which is the fetishism mm -hmm. that we, uh, uh, say, um, add to these totemic presences mm. in the public spaces because you mean I mean if I if I go to New York or Copenhagen when I, or, or for example I'm or uh, in front of the former stock exchange the Borsa di Milano uh, we have a major public work of Maurizio Cattelan which mm. is called the finger which is a marble uh, um, yeah. um, <laughs> gigantic hand uh, mm -hmm. that does this very clear sign. And he said, is it a sign because it was against like a contestation to the financial crisis? Mm -hmm. It is something against the uh, <laughs> general community or to, to the, to the attitude, yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, but indeed, it generated a lot of controversies, and mm. uh, but no one really go to that square, enjoy the public space, or to see that, to visit that square as a tourist or mm. as a Milanese. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the from the audience? I, ju I just refer to some thoughts that came when uh, Joe Magroconti was giving his talk, and he showed a couple of pieces of uh, street art by Banksy, and Banksy, thanks to Banksy, I guess, street art now has been elevated to high art, and the, the, the prices that that sort of art is, is, uh, is getting. But it, it, it reminded me of how transformative street art could become. Uh, there's one particular case. There's a small town in, on the island of uh, Vancouver, Vancouver Island in Canada. That was a mill town. It depended completely on a wood, wood mill, timber mill. And the mill was going to close in 1983. And the, the village, the town was going to die. Somebody in the community got the bright idea of painting murals on their walls, on the village walls. And the whole place was transformed. Within a very short time, they were getting about half a million visitors <laughs> really? to see the village. Mm -hmm. And the village survived. How art, street art, really could transform 
uh, a community. The other idea that I got, well, as you were talking about, you know, street art, we have so many canvases here in Malta. Hmm? <laughs> we have acres and acres of blank party walls that could be transformed through street art. Of course, if we try to do it, you know, the authorities will clamp down on it in most cases because it's legal to do that. But wouldn't it be wonderful? You, sh you showed some of the slides of the confusion that they have. Improving, you know, putting street art or murals on these walls <laughs> surely couldn't make things worse. They could only make things better. And uh, you know, there are lots and lots of examples in, uh, throughout the world of uh, these murals on these walls that, that uh, improve or enhance an area. You know, but I remember in Quebec City, for example, there are quite, a, quite an interesting numbers well, all over. So that's something that maybe we could consider. Maybe we have a... a, a an exhibition of street art and using some of these blank party walls that we have. <laughs> and if we don't like that, we paint them over, you know? So it's no big deal. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah. That's a point, if I, if I may. One, I don't know whether it's illegal to, uh, if there's a blank party wall, although we have to remember property rights, ownership rights and access rights, trespassing, so <laughs> those <Sorry>. legalities. <laughs> so, but actually one. painting on a wall, whether it's legal or not, unless it's a historic building or a historic art that, that you're defacing it, even if you're creating another work of art, one has to be very attentive. But here we're talking about the blank party walls. What happens then if that mural, I won't call it graffiti, because usually graffiti is spray painting words and what a mural that would have acquired some, as I said, with Banksy as, uh, as soon as he, if it's a he, uh, finishes the work, it becomes heritage. Then it's untouchable. If it's, people would start saying, no, don't build there because now there is this mural and we cherish it and it's now part of our heritage. It raises another set of problems. What if you paint it over again? You, 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 you create problems. Um, Coincidentally, yesterday I was zapping on TV and on an Italian station I saw a feature about Ravo, one of these mural artists, and he is being commissioned by the community, by the local council or whoever, by hospitals, um, to do murals, some of them taken from Caravaggio or the celebrate artists, Renaissance and Baroque artists, uh, using <coughs> spray cans, gigantic walls, Okay, um, in rundown areas, in areas that ne they need a bit of color, and as you mentioned, the Vancouver, the island in Vancouver, to enliven the place and give it some sense of place, a sense of belonging, to, so people, the community would have some pride, because it doesn't have anything that connects or, 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 or outshines um, the potential of the place. So yes, there is this potential, and I'm sure Mikas and other entities uh, involved um, and local artists can come up with ideas of where to place this, but there could be consequences then. What to do with the work of art if someone else wants to change that place? Then it becomes a, a point of contention, so even there one has to be uh, very careful, I think. Um, thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. Yes. There's a question. Yeah. Oh. Oh, this is <coughs> There's a no. question. Do we have another question? Yeah. yeah, this one just here. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, I have a question for um, Joe uh, Magroconti. Um, I think one of the things that this kind of conference has kind of brought to light. Um, is that we kind of do have a little bit of a crisis in public space at the moment. Um, and in your own presentation, you, you kind of brought up the question, you showed the picture of St. Julian's and brought up the question, um, kind of what went wrong here. Um, from your experience, your 25 years in the planning authority, um, do you have any kind of insight or perhaps can share any thoughts 
on, on what went wrong and how we can kind of move forward productively and, and creatively. Thank you. Uh, um, in architecture, I wish I have become an architect, but I wasn't good, very good in maths and physics. But I strongly believe that in design, uh, less is more. Um, like Ms. Van der Rohe uh, used to say, um, minimalist. Yes, um, and using Vitruvius from the Roman era, 2,000 <laughs> years ago, the principles, if you combine the two, you can still have good architecture. I think it's the misunderstanding of architecture, building, planning, development, building construction. They all mean something different. And I think we mix them all into one jumble and somehow we, we, we misinterpret what architecture is, what building construction is, what planning for what. Remember, Vitruvius gave us three basic principles, if I still remember correctly. Uh, firmitas, solidity of the structure, it has to stand the test of time, like the megalithic temples, the fortifications, St. John, they had uh, war ravaging wars, Second World War, they still there. Commoditas or utilitas, the function, okay, for what? Function, the residents, Buildings are containers, they have to serve a function. And with old buildings, I find it interesting that many of them, not all, many of them can transform in function with little adaptations. Okay, um, so they can serve a, long, uh, a longer life. And they are more environmentally friendly because the materials that were used in the past are still being used. But we can't live always in the past and in old buildings. We need to create new buildings, new infrastructure. Remember that we need to improve our infrastructure. So I think it's... And then the other thing, the third principle was Venustas, beauty. And with beauty, then he gives us a whole set of another kit about proportion, rhythm, and so on, and order, harmony. And I think what's lacking is harmony. So yes, what went wrong? I can't explain it on my own. I think it, it needs, uh, rather than a larger de debate, a good study from people in the know, and we have people in the know here in Malta, in the institutions, in the university, in private practice, with assistance and help from overseas experts, and see how we can improve, perhaps a pilot project, improve one area which we consider as an eyesore or a jumble, and I think that would be most challenging of how to correct past mistakes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Nobu, for moderating that panel discussion. Thank you to our panelists, uh, Mr. Joseph Macroconti, Mr. Marco San Michele, local artist, Mr. Cesar Attard, and of course, Dr. Georgina Portelli. We're actually nearing the end of our conference for today, so to properly close this off, I would now like to invite Dr. Owen Bonici, the Honorable Minister for National Heritage, the Arts, and Local Government. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon actually, good afternoon to everyone that's here with us in this uh, very beautiful endeavor to discuss uh, such a, an important subject. I would like to welcome Professor Richard Noble, Head of the Arts Department at Goldsmiths College and a political philosopher. Professor Jean-Paul De Lucca from the Philosophy Department of the University and we were former colleagues when we were students. Marco San Michele, director of the Museo del Design Italiano and curator of the Triennale di Milano, Cesar Attart, a practicing artist, and a great exponent of the Maltese Contemporary Idiom, and all Mike's board members. As envisaged, the, present, the presence of Mike's since its concept launch in 2018 has positively strengthened our country's cultural infrastructure and the contemporary art sector. Following its remit, MICAS has already enhanced significantly Malta's visibility on the international contemporary art scene through
through a dedicated program that is steadily attracting the attention of the international art world. We are therefore motivated to realize our country's international aspirations to be innovative with a high profile contemporary public art development, such as that intended for the MICAS Sculpture Garden project. The benefits of public art relate to social, economic, environmental, and cultural factors. Our towns and villages are themselves social spaces that experience change, whether through rapid development or changes in demographics. We recognize the value of art and culture in promoting dialogue and well-being, as well as the role they play in strengthening local identity and cohesion. Art in public or urban spaces can be a catalyst for wider participation and inclusion, whether it is socially engaged arts activity, temporary installation, or permanent artwork in our villages, cities, and suburbs. As stated in the government's program, we also recognize the need to improve the quality of our built environment and urban spaces. We are committed to enhance these and create vibrant public spaces that people can relate to and that as social spaces serve the needs of our communities. We are just as committed to improving the well-being of all our communities through culture and the arts as our new cultural policy and strategy amply show. Art is a big positive. Art contributes positively to uh, place making for our communities and neighborhoods for this purpose and in order to sustain the continuity and development of art in public spaces, as outlined in our new cultural policy, we are developing an art in public spaces management plan that will cater for the proper management and promotion of art in public spaces in Malt and Gozo, including its overall upkeep and conservation. The management plan will also address any relevant legislation, planning policies, and other measures in which public art can be integrated in small to large scale private and public developments. We will continue to endorse a public art policy to bridge the gaps. We have to bridge the gaps between artists and communities. We have to enhance collaboration between various stakeholders while making artistic, creative, and cultural expression accessible to the wider community. Our, inter our intention, therefore, is to keep on investing. We have to invest in culture, we have to invest in creativity, so that we can further increase the cultural capital of our people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honourable Minister. That brings us to the end of this year's conference. Thank you very much to all our speakers and our panellists and to all of you for obviously attending. We'd like to invite you now to join us downstairs for some refreshments. Thank you very much and on behalf of MICAS, have a wonderful day. <laughs>